when a patient comes to your office, my office, any physician's office, if we give that patient a vitamin D pill or a statin, we're essentially putting a Band-Aid on something and not treating the root cause. And, and, and you, I think, accurately pointed out that that could be killing someone, <laughs> you know, that could be harmful to someone. If we give people the wrong impression that giving a pill is enough, you know, that giving a statin is enough to reverse your coronary artery disease, then they're not going to actually understand what the real cause of it is. Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? I am in Texas. I've been in Texas a week. It's so exciting. I am also super excited to tell you all that the second edition of my book, The Carnivore Code, is now available. You can go to thecarnivorecodebook.com if you want to see the new cover. It is available there through HMH, my publisher, Houghton Mifflin, uh, who I am super excited to be working with to get this book much broader distribution to bring this message to many more people and affect more lives positively. But check out thecarnivorecodebook.com. From that website, you can access the book available for pre-order at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, everywhere that books are sold now. The first edition is now a collector's item. I hope you all got a copy of that when you wanted it. Um, If you have a copy of the first edition, you are a lucky individual. If you don't have a copy of my book, you can get a copy of the second edition, which will be released in audio, ebook, and print August the 4th, 2020. Mark your calendars for the party time day. That is Stay Radical Day. August the 4th, 2020 is when it's coming out, but you can pre-order it and support me now. Thank you so much for your support. It is a very, very exciting thing, but you go to thecarnivorecodebook.com to see the new cover. And I will announce the new cover this week on Instagram and Facebook and everywhere. If you are listening to this on Tuesday, June the 9th, I might have already announced the new cover. It's super exciting. So this is a super fun podcast with my buddy, Dr. Jack Wolfson. He is known as the paleo cardiologist. You can find him at the doctors Wolfson. He wrote a book, which is now free. As I learned in this podcast, the paleo cardiologist, uh, is the name of the book. And It is a great book. It actually mirrors a lot of the things that I talk about in my book. We have a few different views on stuff, but we talk about a lot of commonalities in this show. I wanted to talk a little bit about coronavirus, but honestly, I'm pretty tired of talking about coronavirus, and I know you are all probably tired of hearing about coronavirus. So we talked about coronavirus in the context of insulin resistance and cholesterol, and that was about it. The majority of the podcast is about cholesterol, lipids, uh, it's about pharma, it's about glyphosate, it's about all these things that are affecting our lives and shaping our medical system in a broad way. And as always, I try to offer lots of intense science in this one. So if you want the video, watch it on YouTube or check me out on Instagram at carnivoremd to see snippets throughout the week of the highlights from this surely radical podcast. I very much appreciate Jack Wolfson for the work he's doing. He's a classically trained cardiologist who is bucking the norm, and I really believe doing very good work for his patients. As you all know, if you know my story, I was a PA in cardiology before I went back to medical school, so we have a lot of kinship in the cardiology world. So I hope you will enjoy this podcast. As I have hinted at many times, I have a very, very exciting project, which I will be telling you guys about in the next few weeks. Stay tuned. Check my Instagram. Listen to the podcast. There is a very new, exciting project that will allow you guys to get amazing, complete nose to tail nourishment in a much easier way that is coming very soon. I can't wait to share it all with you. I won't tell you about it just yet, but I'm going to tease it because it's really something that is close to my heart and soul. It is something I am super passionate about, and I will tell you about it very soon. This podcast is sponsored by my friends at whiteoakpastures.com. They are a sixth-generation family farm, 150 years in the family. They've been doing regenerative farming for 20 years. So amazing. And 
they are leading the charge in this way. The founder, Will Harris, is an amazing guy. He's been on a bunch of podcasts recently, but they are doing grass-fed, grass-finished meat, uh, beef, lamb. They're also doing Iberian pork. They have guinea, which is a bird. They have chickens and turkeys. When you come to the farm in October for White Oak Cello, which I hope you all will, you will see the way that regenerative farming works. They rotationally graze, they compost all of the animal remains and waste back onto the soil, and not the bad waste, the good waste, the poop, the pee, and basically bones and parts of the animals that aren't used that most people would throw in a garbage can or a landfill, they put back onto the land the way that it's supposed to be as the bison used to die on the land, as a deer dies in the woods on the land and becomes a part of the soil. That makes the soil so much richer. When you touch the dirt, when you see the dirt, At White Oak Pastures, you will see that it is the color of chocolate. It is dark. It is incredibly dark, and that is because it has so much organic matter in it. And that is amazing because it sequesters more carbon, it grows healthier plants, it creates healthier mycorrhizal and root networks, and it sequesters more rainwater. Animals need to be on the land to really rehabilitate the land and create healthy soil, and that is one of my other passions. Nose to tail and soil are my passions And as I hinted about, my new business project, my new project is coming soon, and it is going to merge both of those things. So stay tuned for that. Check out whiteoakpastures.com. Come to White Oak Chella. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 10% off your first order at White Oak. This will be some of the best meat and organs you will ever eat. I will assure you of that, my friends. This is amazing stuff and really good people. Give Sarah a call. Tell her I said hi. Tell her I sent you. She is going to answer the phone there. Tell her you appreciate what they are doing, and I will see you in Bluffton, Georgia. Last week's episode was the CGM episode. Super cool episode about continuous glucose monitors. Check out NutriSense.io. You can use the code CarnivoreMD there for 20 bucks off a CGM. Listen to that episode if you want to hear about my carbohydrate experiments, which were very revealing and interesting for me. And I think that anytime we step outside of an established pattern of thinking, we learn and people get challenged. And I think people are triggered by the fact that Carnivore MD ate carbohydrates. People are losing their mind. Well, not really. Most people are super excited that I'm thinking outside the box and exploring new things. I don't eat carbohydrates every day. I still eat an entirely animal-based diet, as I advocated for in my book, The Carnivore Code. And occasionally, I found that I feel best if I include some honey. How much? Listen to last week's CGM podcast to find out. What did it do to my blood sugars? Listen to that podcast to find out. Want to know what carbohydrates do to your blood sugars? Want to know your glycemic variability? Check out NutriSense.io. Use the code CarnivoreMD. Let them know I sent you. Last week was an amazing podcast. Check that one out too. Okay, on to this week's podcast with my buddy, Jack Wolfson. Enjoy the show. Listen after for what is going on with me, you guys. I appreciate you all. Stay radical. <laughs> All right, we are live. Dr. Jack Wolfson, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Great to have you here. I appreciate it. Uh, got a lot to talk about. Let's dive into it. We have so much cool stuff to talk about because you are, as we were chatting before the podcast, probably one of an amazingly valuable species of animal on this planet known as an integrative cardiologist, a traditionally trained cardiologist thinking outside of the box. And uh, in the past, I had Nadir Ali on this podcast, but there's not a whole lot of traditionally trained cardiologists doing what you do in the trenches, seeing patients who are thinking outside of the box. So I think this one is really going to be a valuable, valuable show for people to give different perspectives. So I just wanted to start with this quote. Um, You sent me a copy of your book, uh, which is called The Paleo Cardiologist. I really enjoyed looking through it. And one of the quotes in the beginning of the book you use is from Plato in 427 B.C., And the quote is this, strange times are these in which we live when old and young are taught falsehoods in school. And the person who dares to tell the truth is called a lunatic and a fool. Like that is so, that's just so amazing. This is in, that was in 427 BC. And here we are in 2020 and maybe the same thing is kind of true. So I, I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about your story because you're, like we said, you're a traditionally trained cardiologist, but at some point along the way, you really started thinking a little differently than that. Um, So tell us how you got to this point and what it was like for you. Yeah, sure thing. You know, my father was a cardiologist. He was a board certified cardiologist. He was a, a DO like myself. And he was the first DO at the Cleveland Clinic in 1970. He was the first one allowed in the institution. 
And then from there, he did his cardiology training at the University of Iowa. Again, the first DO at the University of Iowa in the cardiology department. And then from there, he rose to very high levels of success and became the head of cardiology at hospital systems in Chicago and was well published and well traveled and well spoken and uh, really, really just an amazing man. And then to see what happened to him where he started to get uh, sick and he started to, again, become depressed and then it developed into a Parkinson's-like illness and eventually progressive supranuclear palsy was the final diagnosis. And we took him ultimately to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic says, uh, we've got no reason why he's sick. Uh, we've got no, you know, and there's no treatment for him and he'll be dead within three years. And then along the way, I meet this woman who is a doctor of chiropractic and she says, DC doctor of cause. And she's like, you know, your father eats like crap. He, you know, drinks alcohol. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't get sunshine. You know, he's an unhealthy cardiologist uh, lifestyle. And she's like, that's why he's sick. And you're going to be the same way unless you start to change. Because I'm a cardiologist. I became a cardiologist, went to osteopathic school, everything, all because he, he did it. And then I just followed his footsteps. And she's like, you're going to follow in his footsteps right into the grave. And uh, what she said made total sense. Uh, made sense, number one, because my wife's smoking hot. So I totally believed in what she was saying. And then number two, again, it, you know, you see all the sickness around you in the medical system as a cardiologist. And again, it's just pills, procedures, the hospitals, the revolving door. You know, you come in a heart attack, we tune you up, we send you out, and you come back in with another heart attack or a pharmaceutical complication a few months down the road. So I recognized very quickly in talking with her that I needed to start making those changes in my career and in myself personally. And uh, eventually I left the biggest group in the state of Arizona uh, back in 2012 to start my own integrative cardiology practice. That's just so cool. And I love what you say about doctor of cause. I've heard you say that. I say root cause medicine for myself. And I think it's so true. And I, I love that your wife could, could shake you from that mainstream narrative and to be what a cool story that this person that became your wife and that you created this family with and this beautiful life was such a key part of this changing your paradigm from mainstream cardiology to something that's a little bit different that's just that's amazing to me and most listeners of my podcast will know that before going back to medical school at the university of arizona in arizona <laughs> i i was a pa in cardiology and so i've been in the same situation. You know, my dad is a doctor. He was an internist. But my situation is, my story is a little bit similar. My father is, is getting healthier now, but he's now 70 years old. Thankfully, he's still alive. But he lived an unhealthy life just like your father. And so our fathers were both traditionally trained medical doctors who, for all intents and purposes, should have had the best information and are supposed to be the paragons of leading people to supposed health. And yet, my father was obese, he had sleep apnea, he had you know, a lot of medical issues throughout his own life. And I think that that's just, that's just a very tragic thing for me, that even in within medicine, as physicians, we can't heal ourselves. You know, There's like that adage now, physician heal thyself. And it's so true. So to see your, or to hear about your you know, cardiologist father suffer so greatly, because he wasn't addressing the root cause. And I'm hoping that my father, while he's still alive, will continue to address the root cause and, and do more of these things for himself so that he can enjoy the rest of his life. But what an interesting parallel there, so. Well, I mean, think about this. I mean, as far as, you know, when your father went through medical school, uh, my father went through medical school, I'll speak to when I went through medical school, I and mean, I guess you can comment after that, you know, uh, you know, as far as the, the training that we all had regarding actual health and wellness, I mean, about living a healthy lifestyle, we got no training in nutrition, we never talked talked about the importance of sunshine, about sleep, about physical activity. We never talked about mental health and wellness, you know, as, as medical students, right? I did a psychiatry rotation. Not once did we ever talk about anything that had to do with causation of mental health. It was always about the pharmaceuticals. It was always about the procedures. As a cardiology trainee, it was always about cardiology drugs, uh, angioplasty, stents, bypass surgeries, pacemakers, uh, uh, nuclear stress tests, uh, you know, and, and I know you as, as when you spent time as, as a PA in cardiology, right? You're not talking about people about that. And then the people that you work for, 
right? They're just all looking at the revenue. So they're saying, hey, Paul, listen, you know, we got to we got to crank up your number of stress tests to your order. We got to crank up the ultrasounds, the procedures, because this is how, you know, we generate revenue in, in the practice. And it's really just a sick, sick system. And then, Paul, I mean, answer this, too, as far as, you know, again, when you try and talk to your colleagues in cardiology, as I did, about this new found methodology, they don't want to hear it because it destructs, it destroys their paradigm of what they think is, is real medicine. And it also destroys the financial paradigm. So, uh, you know, you're kind of, uh, you're running into the walls everywhere, everywhere you look. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how much nutrition training did you get in your internal medicine residency and your cardiology fellowship and medical school? How much nutrition training did you get? You know, I, I, Paul, to be honest with you, you know, the only thing I can remember from cardiology is I went to the American College of Cardiology meetings in, two, in the year 2000. And I saw a debate between the late Robert Atkins, obviously of Atkins diet, low carb fame, and Dean Ornish of low fat fame. And these guys, you know, debated in front of 10,000 people in the audience. It was clear they hated each other. Um, and I walked out of that meeting and I said, wow, I'm a total believer in low carb living. But even then, listen, I was a 29 year old cardiology resident or cardiology fellow living in Chicago, deep dish pizza, Italian beef sandwiches, hot dogs, really unhealthy uh, food and lifestyle. Uh, so what made sense, I, I didn't really follow it. Uh, only until you know meeting my wife that I really go off the deep end with this with this lifestyle. But again, it's just you know it's just as you know the medical system is owned by the pharmaceutical companies. It's been that way since the early 1900s. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Flexner Report, where they got rid of all alternative medicine and it was all pharmaceutical driven and sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. And it's no different uh, today whatsoever. And yeah, I heard you talking about that on a recent podcast that you did with my buddy, Mark Bell. So um, if people want to hear more about that, I would recommend they listen to that podcast. It was an excellent podcast and I love those guys. But yes, the Flexner Reports, the Rockefellers, the history of allopathic medicine. I too, in PA school, in medical school, in my residency, got essentially no training in nutrition. And um, I wish I'd been there in 2000 to see Atkins debate Ornish. Uh, I've seen Ornish and... You know, he just doesn't look very healthy to me at all. Um, he's pretty soft and overweight and um, Atkins is dead, but he didn't die of a heart attack. And I just want to clarify this. He died because he hit his head on, he's like slipped and hit his head. I, I have vegans and, and plant-based people reach out to me all the time and say like, Atkins died of a heart attack. I, I, if you look it up online, Atkins did not die of a cardiac complication. That is a falsehood. So if those two were still today debating, I think it would be very clear uh, which interventional study would lead to better health and um, at least better body composition and overall better mo metabolic health. But yeah, that's such a great, that's such a great sort of uh, instance that you observed. What a fascinating point in history. So now let's pivot a little bit here with that background. At this point, we're recording this on June the 5th, 2020. I'm going to release it in a couple of days. I like to do these topical podcasts right now during coronavirus time. And I think most of my listeners are probably sick of hearing about coronavirus, which is good. So if you're sick of hearing about coronavirus, I'm glad that we've talked it to death, but it's just a very important issue. And before we, we're not going to spend most of this podcast talking about coronavirus, but I do think it's something interesting. And I would love to get your perspective on this because I think that you and I agree strongly that insulin resistance, metabolic health is such a huge factor here. So Let's just talk a little bit about your perspectives on the coronavirus pandemic as an interventional cardiologist, as somebody in the sort of paleolithic health space and what you observed and how you think humans might be able to best prepare themselves for infectious pandemics like this. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's... Uh... Uh, to me, it's, it's actually we build our body up, not tear it down. And when you take pharmaceuticals, when you take injection vaccines, when you fill your body full of garbage, you're, you're, you're weakening the immune system. And therefore, not only are you prone to coronavirus or influenza or other viruses, of which, of course, there are trillions of uh, in our bodies, you know, bacteria, fungus, parasites, you name it. We're weakening the immune system. 
uh, when you have a weakened immune system, bad food, bad lifestyle, well, now you're going to be subjected to the negative effects of 5G, for example, more so than somebody else, or mold mycotoxins more so than somebody else. Uh, we're never going to defeat nature, uh, and it's going to be very difficult to defeat uh, modern uh, man-made toxins as well. The only, the only thing we have is to keep our bodies as strong as possible. As you mentioned, it's, it's certainly is impacted by diet and we can talk and, and decide as far as like, you know, what are the best diets for the short term, long term, all these different diet debates that are out there, but let, let's leave diet aside for a second. Let's talk about how important sunshine is to building the immune system and what sunshine does to not only produce vitamin D, but create nitric oxide and, and increase the levels of melatonin, all these things that are important, including sun or, or is, is food any more important than adequate sleep? And the answer to that is no, sleep is, is probably the most important thing out of all parameters in what makes common sense, but also in the medical literature. So let's not debate about you know, the healthy lifestyle. Let's make sure we're you know, doing the healthy lifestyle stuff because that's how we're gonna, you know, Corona's coming back again, undoubtedly. Um, and then also, you know, I'll tell you, you know, Paul, as we talk about this, that when we talk about what's happened with fear and stress and anxiety, and I know this is a large part of your training as well, and I wrote this chapter five of my book, it's called One Nation Under Prozac, where the answer is not Prozac, the answer is getting a hold of your mental health and wellness, yet right now, uh, with unemployment levels, what they are, stress, fear, anxiety, what they are, the, the cardiology con you know, consequences are catastrophic. So, Yeah, yeah and I, you highlighted so many things there that, that I've been thinking for the last 10 weeks. I've been talking in my social media repeatedly about mainstream media fear mongering and um, they're, they're ignoring their apparently, potentially, you know, intentional ignorance toward evidence that, it, that severe coronavirus outcomes are connected with insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera, and the vitamin D stuff. I did a podcast with Mark Bell a couple of weeks ago where we went into lots of detail about the vitamin D stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit here today because I want to build on that just a little bit, but I want to share just a few things about coronavirus that people will have seen if they follow me on social media. This is a great paper um, that was sent to me by my buddy, Joe Marcola, Association of the Insulin Resistance Marker, TYG, which is the triglyceride to glucose index with the severity and mortality of COVID-19. And this TYG index, which is just a, a product of the, the fasting triglycerides and fasting glucose, is a great predictor of the severity and morbidity of COVID-19 patients. And what is a TY? What is a triglyceride? Uh, glucose index going to tell you, it's going to tell you about your insulin sensitivity without a doubt. And that's just, I just, these type of things are just baffling to me that the mainstream media continues to ignore this really, really strong predictor of coronavirus um, severity. And it's such a malleable thing. And we'll get to this. You can definitely become more insulin resistant through diet. You can become more insulin resistant by not getting sleep, like you said. And we can probably develop some degree of insulin resistance by also not having an adequate amount of sunlight. So all those things, like you're talking about this paleolithic, I love this idea of an ancestral lifestyle, which is why I was so excited to connect with you. This is another paper that I just wanna share on the podcast again, um, a study on the infectivity of asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 carriers. This one is fascinating because it shows that people who are um, symptom, asymptomatic with coronavirus, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, actually don't spread the virus that much. Uh, the conclusion here, in summary, all the 455 contacts were excluded from SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we conclude that the infectivity of some asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 carriers might be weak. That is a study looking at the actual, all 455 um, contacts of someone who had coronavirus and essentially they were all excluded from getting um, from getting the actual infection so that's just crazy now the reason I wanted to talk about that one is because every time I've talked about those two studies YouTube has censored my videos <laughs> this is the other thing that's crazy to me and I think must play into this media fear-mongering and the whole zeitgeist around coronavirus, whenever I've posted a video on YouTube and three to four of them have been taken down for violating community guidelines in the last two weeks, and they're all kind of based around this flatten the fear idea, the flatten the fear, like we don't need to be afraid of this virus. And that is violating YouTube community guidelines because I'm showing, 
a published paper about asymptomatic spread of coronavirus being essentially negligible and then showing papers about insulin resistance, et cetera. So that to me is just freaking wild. Um, I'll talk about this one now and this will be a good segue to vitamin D. Um, the role of vitamin D in the prevention of coronavirus disease, 2019 infection mortality. This is a great paper and there's another one that I've talked about um, also previously. And basically this is a cross-sectional analysis. It has limitations, but it showed very clearly like the other papers that I have spoken about with regard to vitamin D, and I'm sure that you've talked about, that lower levels of vitamin D are associated with worse coronavirus outcomes. Now, one of the things that I love that you, I was like, I was literally doing like the clap out loud when I heard you talk about this on Mark Bell's Power Project, because I agree with you 100%. You said, and I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this, that a vitamin D pill is not the same as the real sun. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, essentially, uh, you know, the, the literature shows that people with the highest levels of vitamin D have the lowest risk of everything. Yeah. And whether it's cancer, heart disease, dementia, uh, mental health, uh, you know, issues, it really is, you know, but it's, it's really on those people that are highly based on sun exposure and also the vitamin D, of course, that you can get from food. But let's say, of course, the best source is the sun. And uh, when it comes to supplementation supplementation can raise levels of vitamin d it just doesn't really make any difference in 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 the outcomes in the majority of situations vitamin d supplementation there is some data on cardiovascular outcomes on blood pressure there is some data when it comes to asthma and pulmonary issues and the answer is is not going to be the supplement it's going to be getting the getting the sunshine and you know when i speak all over and or people come to see me in arizona they come where do they come they come from vitamin d deficient locations canada um you know uh, pacific northwest they come from russia norway minnesota my hometown of chicago you know they come from those places and my suggestion to them is uh you got to move you got to move to a location where you get a lot of sun you got to Take a lot of vacations if you can't. And then if you need to supplement in the winter time, go ahead and supplement in the winter time. But sunshine is the time, the summertime is the time to stack up all that sun. That's really what's what's critical, uh, critical there in the vitamin D story. Because again, you know, you know, vitamin D has to go through so many different processes in, in the body and eventually has to become vitamin D sulfate uh, for it to become uh, you know, truly its, its effective form. So there's multiple different steps to the vitamin D to make sure it's effective. Yeah, and you've highlighted this before. It's something that, that I've noticed as well, that the vitamin D that's made in our skin is cholecalciferol sulfate. And the vitamin D we take in a pill is just cholecalciferol. And so one of them is fat soluble and one of them is water soluble. This is actually similar to the research that Stephanie Seneff has done. And at the end of this podcast, if we have time, we'll get into the glyphosate stuff, talking about cholesterol sulfate that's formed in the skin. But there are many things that are formed in the skin that we cannot replicate with a vitamin D pill. So there's, there's nitric oxide, there's endorphins, there's cholesterol sulfate, and there's cholecalciferol sulfate, which is different than this form of vitamin D we take in a pill, water soluble relative to fat soluble. And as you point out, and I think this is such an important point to emphasize to people, and it, it recapitulates the thing that I talk about so often, which is the danger of epidemiology. We use epidemiology when it's all we've got, but we have to acknowledge its limitations that Epidemiologically, in observational studies, those with the highest levels of vitamin D always do the best. But as you're suggesting, in the interventional studies with cardiovascular outcomes, with psychiatric outcomes, with common cold outcomes, when we give people vitamin D, they don't get the same benefits that appear to be suggested by the associational epidemiology, which means there are many hypotheses we can generate from that, but it suggests that either the sun has unique benefits or the people who are in the sun more are doing other valuable things. Either way, I think you can make a really pretty strong case that being in the real sun is way better. And I love that you said this because people will always ask me, what do I do if I live in Manchester, England? What do I, if I do, in, what do, I, do if I live in the, in the north, in New York? Shouldn't I take vitamin D pills then? And I say, yeah, you can take a little bit of vitamin D. Don't overdose on vitamin D. Make sure it's vitamin D3 and not the D2 synthetic ergo calciferol that they're going to give you in many places at the pharmacy, but don't expect that that vitamin D pill is going to give you all the benefits that are suggested by these epidemiology trials. That's, that's a falsehood. And that's giving people a false sense of security with just taking a vitamin D pill. 
I say to them, you need to get a vitamin D lamp, but your solution is a better one. Just move. But then everybody will be in the South with me now that I'm in Texas. So I mean, I guess, you know, but definitely getting real sunlight or real ultraviolet light in the form of a vitamin D lamp or taking a lot of vacations to Hawaii is probably the best thing here. We can't ignore this. And yeah, I mean, listen, if we're trying to give people the optimal solutions, I mean, this is what people need to do. Uh, you know, we're not in the business of giving people, well, you know, what, uh, you know, eat, you know, do this when you can, eat this when you can. It's a matter of, okay, if you want to live the longest, best life, here's how you're going to do it. And if it means moving, you know, that's the best advice for you. Um, you know, when you, when you, you know, take these people that again, live in these climates and, and they're trying to, you know, get their best results, they're not going to get them uh, unless they usually say, yeah, for every five to seven, weeks you're up in that climate five to seven days of vacations uh is absolutely critical to soak up that sun get as close as you know to the equator as you can um and that's how we're going to you know make some you know real real differences but i think you know also is that the the people the people that are the sickest here going back to this coronavirus story here uh and and as you know the people with coronary artery disease people with hypertension the the people with diabetes, the people that would suffer the consequences from any viral infection, including Corona, um, they're the people that see medical doctors. They're the people that see the medical doctors and are under their care and get their pharmaceuticals. Those are the people that are dying. The people that are healthy and well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna die. So the key really is, I think, is to get away from medical doctors, see holistic practitioners, and you know, you'll you'll get so much more information from listening to. You know your podcast, your guests, uh, the, you know my book. You know than than anything else they're going to get from their medical doctor, which is just more pills. Yeah, I I agree with you, and you know I think that there are, as you've said, and I agree with, there are certainly times acutely where allopathic medicine is very valuable. If someone is actually having a ruptured plaque, if they're having a heart attack, if they're having a ruptured appendix or a ruptured bowel, yes. But long-term chronic medical care, I think you can make this really good argument that that may not be doing us a lot of favors. Um, acutely, yes. If I break my arm, if I'm you know, surfing or foiling, I need to go to a medical doctor. I recently cut my hand on my foil board. I went to an urgent care, and I was grateful for the physician there that sutured my hand, right? Fantastic. Acute care, Western medicine does fantastically, but I fear that because we are so good at acute care, Western medicine has this inflated ego. <laughs> and Western medicine believes itself to be the end all and the be all. And I, I really am saddened by the fact that Western medicine doesn't have a more open mind toward other ways of thinking about things, preventive, holistic, doctor of cause type of ways of thinking about all of this, which we know are probably gonna be much better. And I think you're absolutely right. The people that see doctors long-term don't tend to do as well. And again, this is not to criticize any physicians that are listening to this, just to say that as we've all been taught in medical school, we haven't been taught how to get to the root cause of things. And I don't think that, I remember the physicians that I worked with as a cardiology PA were very well intentioned, good people. They just, and they were very intelligent. They just weren't taught, you know, to think this way. And they saved lives. They saved lives doing stents and they saved lives opening arteries and veins and revascularizing, but they didn't have the tools because they were limited by the paradigm that they were taught in. So I think that it's, it's an interesting thing. And I was looking for this article, I can't find it. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. I saw this article one time, uh, I think it was in Israel, there was a study of, of an improvement in overall mortality when the hospitals closed and the hospital workers went on strike. Have you heard about this? It's a really famous article that came out a while ago, like the hospital workers went on strike and there was a decrease in all cause mortality. And it was, whether or not that was because there were less deaths being recorded, I don't think so. I think it was because when people were having less of this care, they, they almost did a little bit better. And it, it argues to the, the very real possibility that we cannot ignore that sometimes in Western medicine, perhaps often in Western medicine, at least with chronic care and not acute care, we do harm people, perhaps some more than we help them. So a couple yeah, more. Yeah, I remember... Uh yeah, uh, you know, real quick, Paul. When I was a medical, uh, uh, when I was a medical resident, actually, we talked about going on strike, and we talked about, uh, you know, because this was like in the, this is in the late '90s, and it was all about, hey, you know, we're all underpaid and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, you know, we're all going to go on strike, and we were actually we were talking with unions and stuff like that. 
Um, and um, uh, and actually, one of our one of our training one of our mentors actually said that uh, you know she, be careful if you go on strike because then the public's going to find out that they don't actually need us. And and I agree with you. I'm not I'm not denigrating the people in acute care as far as angioplasty stents in the midst of a heart attack. Or again, yeah, people, someone's, uh, you know, COVID pneumonia, you know, kudos to all of our colleagues that are, that are there doing that stuff. But when it comes to prevention, the medical doctors have nothing. Aspirin is not prevention. Statin drugs are not prevention. Blood pressure drugs are not prevention. Uh, mammograms, colonoscopies, that, that's not prevention at all. And it's just all that they've been taught, like you said. But I think that we can, I don't want to, again, throw our colleagues uh, you know, under the, under the, you know, tires. But if we say that modern medicine is killing millions of people, I, I can believe it to be true because again, we're missing all those opportunities to educate all those people about real health and wellness. And when you give someone Lipitor, you're killing them because you're not telling them the actual way to health, health and wellness. Now, the medical doctors would say, well, you know, listen, Lipitor decreases heart attack, strokes, and dying. Well, it does so from, you know, 5% down to uh, 4% in, in some scenarios. Uh, now, so that means you're leaving 4% of people to die because you didn't tell them the truth. And I think, um, I think it's time again to, you know, to really call on, on all of our traditionally trained medical doctor you know brothers and sisters here and say it's time to 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 wake up and really become a doctor of cause to really start making a difference and really unplug from the pharmaceutical system and spend more time educating people on health and wellness as opposed to that quick model of every 10 minutes you see people here's the pharmaceuticals and I think, you know, listen, it, it, is, it is financially driven. Let me tell you one more story. You know, when I started cardiology practice in 2002, the cardiologist who ran the group sat me down and he said, listen, this is how we make money here. We order nuclear stress tests on everybody. That's how you're going to drive a fancy car, uh, you know, live in a nice house, buy nice clothing, yada, yada, yada. Um, we order nuclear stress tests on everybody because when we do so, every time somebody does a nuclear stress test, we make $2,000, $2,000 into our practice. So again, I think that like you said, the doctors in many cases start off with a very altruistic uh, belief system, but you know, I mean, and it's been proven in the literature that you can buy a doctor's opinion from a pharmaceutical company, you can buy their opinion by giving them a pen. By giving them a pen can change their opinions as far as prescribing, uh, tests, pharmaceuticals, whatever it may be. So doctors can be bought. It's just, um, it's just the way it is. Do we need to make pens with stakes on them? We should make pens with stakes on them. <laughs> You know what I was thinking too, as far as kind of like, a, you know, like, it, you know, it was all those like arm bands and Lance Armstrong and Live Strong and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, you would have like this little wristband that would be made out of some uh, free range grass fed uh, cow skin. And it would be like a leather strap here, you know, that said, uh, you know, eat carnivore or eat paleo, eat organic, just all these little, you know, mantras that people could look at. So every time you went to go lift a, a donut up, up to do a donut up to your mouth, you'd be able to look at this and be like, whoa, I shouldn't eat that. I shouldn't eat that. And we'll get into all that stuff. So I just want to, I want to, we can close out our coronavirus conversation. I apologize if people are already sick of hearing about this coronavirus stuff, but I just want to share a couple of more um, interesting things. Uh, this is something I found on Twitter a little while ago. This is the share of COVID-19 deaths occurring in nursing and assisted living facilities. And you can see um, the numbers are pretty staggering. <laughs> Number one, that in uh, Washington and Oregon, 61% of coronavirus deaths occurred in uh, an assisted living facility. Look at this, 81%, 62%, 67%. 60, and I, I, again, this is just a trend, but we can see here the northern states are worse right? These are the states in which people are, are probably more in nursing homes or uh, in the nursing homes in these northern states, there is a higher percentage of coronavirus deaths, at least in the nursing homes in these states. Now, the caption here, I think, is very telling, which is, can you imagine how many lives would have been saved had our leaders spent even half uh, the time, capital, and manpower on protecting the most vulnerable among us 
as they did trying to keep the healthy welded up inside. And I thought that was a very insightful comment there. Because well, Paul, I mean, yeah, let, me, let me just throw these statistics out there, you know, real quick as far as, you know, what happens when, what, you know, again, the government shut down the economy. So what happens when people are unemployed? So a risk of committing suicide. Yes. When you're unemployed, you have a 280% higher risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. So, uh, so you know, again, the, the, when we look back on all this, you know, years from now, so how many more people had heart attacks? How many more people had strokes? Uh, you know, because of what happened to the economy. And, you know, there, there's, there's that facet of it. Now, to me personally, I would have said, whatever this virus is, let it blow through everybody. If you want to stay home, you want to protect yourself, you want to stay out. A nursing homes, lockdown, and nursing home. but as far as shutting down the economy, keeping people away from from living their lives, uh, and in this sudden change of what happened, and 50 million people unemployed or at risk of being unemployed, uh, I think it's going to have catastrophic downstream consequences. And and, and again, they're going to trot this back out there uh, in the next few months. Now they've proved they can lock us down, make us all wear masks. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a scary proposition and it'll be coming. It's super scary stuff. And I appreciate you saying that about the unemployment because I, I completely agree with you. And I've highlighted that in my own social media as well, that there are many invisible complications of the lockdown, which will never be attributed to those who are guilty of them. And we can never be held, you know, those who have made those decisions will never be held accountable. I've called this invisible blood in my, uh, previous podcast with my friend Ivor Cummins. So I think let's pivot because we've got this unique opportunity to talk to um, a, you know, an integrative cardiologist about cholesterol, about saturated fat. And I think that the segue I'd like to use is just a series of studies. And I've talked about this previously. I want to highlight a series of studies that I'm sure you saw looking at um, how low levels of cholesterol are associated with worse coronavirus outcomes. So these are fascinating and we can get into why this might be the case. I know you talk about it in your book, The Paleocardiologist. I talked about it in my book, The Carnivore Code. Hypolipidemia is associated with the severity of COVID-19. Uh, low density of the protein is a potential predictor of poor prognosis in patients with coronavirus 2019. And a letter to the editor by Ufe Ravenskoff uh, cholesterol lowering treatment may worsen the outcome of COVID-19 infection. And I just think that this is going to be, if people are curious for more conversation about cholesterol and LDL, we'll get into saturated fat, we'll get into LP little a. Um, you can listen to the previous podcasts I've done with Nadir Ali, Dave Feldman times two, Malcolm Kendrick and Ivor Cummins. But um, there's a large amount of information. I'm so happy to be able to add to that. But isn't this fascinating? And I know that you'll understand this, um, this well from your position that lower cholesterol is associated with worse coronavirus outcomes. I think that this, in addition to many other things that I talk about in my book, argue strongly for an immunologic indispensable role for cholesterol and lipoproteins, which carry cholesterol in the human body. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean most certainly. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally, it's a matter of, you know, when, when the when the powers that be started vilifying uh, LDL and calling it the bad cholesterol, so that was all pharmaceutical speak, uh, you know, calling that the bad and HDL the good, and it's just, well, why do animal species and all mammals on planet Earth make uh, LDL and they make HDL? They're all for a reason. And as you stated, the LDL is a huge part of the immune system, and that's what it's there for. So I think a couple things. Number one is that those people that have low level LDL and they have a higher risk of pneumonia severity from any kind of virus, I think it implies a couple things. Number one is that, well, now they don't have the LDL particles to be able to do the job to assist the immune system, be part of the immune system to, again, attack any virus and keep that under control. But it also highlights the fact that those people with low level LDLs are probably unhealthy. Again, their bodies are just not making the tools it needs to get the job done. So there's many different factors uh, you know, that are, that are in there that we need to look at. And uh, 
we have to understand, again, the body is, is making LDL, that LDL is the bus that leaves the liver and travels all around the body to do its job. And it's there for you know, repair, it's there as an antioxidant, uh, it's there to support the body processes, including the immune system, uh, to actually get the job done. And when people, again, do these dietary strategies or pharmaceutical strategies to lower that number down, in the case of pharmaceuticals, uh, artificially, we're going to suffer the consequences from it. And having these new studies that come out that, that show that, I think really just kind of adds to the literature we've had over many years that show that people with low levels of LDL have a lot of immunologic issues and have a lot of uh, infectious disease issues as well, because again, we're taking away part of the immune system. And my goodness, <laughs> were you taught that LDL was a part of the immune system in your cardiology fellowship? <laughs> because I was never taught that as a PA, and I was certainly never taught that in my medical school training. I mean, was that ever talked about that LDL could have a beneficial role in the human body in your training? It was just, right, it was just always that it is bad. It was never about, you know, again, it's, I think, you know, again, we learned a lot of this stuff in medical school as far as LDL and uh, HDL and maybe what some of their values were. But even then, it was so geared toward how that fits into the pharmacology model. And, well, you know, here's what LDL uh, is. And high levels of LDL are linked to cardiovascular disease um, in, in those old studies and then here's the pharmaceutical classes that are being developed to lower that number down and no you're right it's just it was just never ever ever discussed and i'd love to go back to those days because as fellows we used to give lectures to each other uh, and, and and the attending physicians that would come in and listen to our powerpoint presentations and i just remember it was just always about it was always about disease. It was always about pharmaceuticals. It was always about procedures. It was never about the glories of why the body does all this magic. And it's, it's you know, when people look at LDL, again, it's the bus that carries, you know, uh, the passengers around the body. That's why the liver makes it and sends it out. So what are those passengers on the LDL, the fat soluble vitamins, ADEK, CoQ10 is on there, phospholipids and cholesterol is in that LDL bus because that's how you deliver cholesterol to the rest of the body. So cholesterol can be used in every cellular function. And again, the cardiologists and the pharmaceutical companies really have done the job of brainwashing the public, brainwashing the cardiologists into thinking that it's the LDL that's bad, and it's just led, again, to millions of people dying needlessly. My goodness. Well said. I could not agree with you more. And to me, it just never made sense intuitively that our bodies, throughout millions of years of evolution, primate, hominid, would have a lipoprotein in the body that was essential for human life, that was indispensable, that was a carrier of fat-soluble vitamins, coenzyme Q10 building blocks for cells, cholesterol, the precursor steroid backbone of hormones, sex hormones, all these valuable hormones in our body, that was also killing us. <laughs> that was also killing us at the same time. It's an indispensable part of your body, but if the concentration of cholesterol goes up a little bit, it's gonna kill you. It's not gonna kill you if it's 80 milligrams per deciliter, which we know is false. There's plenty of literature to show that the actual amount of LDL in the body, if we measure it by milligrams per deciliter, is there's really very poor correlation in many studies between incidents of, of heart attacks, and I'll show some interesting data about that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I talk about in my book is that if you do an NMR, if you do a nuclear magnetic resonance lipid profile, you can get the nanomole per liter of, of LDL, and you can get the nanomole per liter and that'll give you a number because molar measurements are numbers of particles. I can get a particle number for LDL in my body. And if you calculate the number of particles, LDL particles in someone's body who has an LDL of 70 milligrams per deciliter, which you know, 99% of cardiologists in this country would say that's fantastic. That number is still astronomically large, like 10 to the 16th. 10 to the 16th particles of LDL floating around in your bloodstream and my bloodstream when we have an LDL of 70 milligrams per deciliter. 
But if you go to your cardiologist and you have an LDL of 150 milligrams per deciliter, and that number is now twice as big, instead of one times 10 to the 16th, it's two times 10 to the 16th, that amount of LDL particles is going to kill you. <laughs> if you just do sort of the Brownian motion, chaotic physics of it all, 10 to the 16th particles is a massive number of LDL particles. In fact, it's larger than the number of cells in our body. And that number of LDL particles will not lead to atherosclerosis, but two times into the 16th, that will lead to atherosclerosis. And it's just, that never made sense to me. And that taken on the account that like, what are we doing here? That's, that can't be the issue. The whole paradigm of lowering LDL makes no sense to me. There has to be something else going on, this spark to light the fire, which people who listen to my podcast will know that I believe is insulin resistance. And we can talk a little bit about that, but, um, have you ever thought about that in terms of the calculation and the actual number of LDL particles in the human body, even when it's astronomically low? Even if you do something like the Fourier trial where you give someone uh, a statin and a, uh, uh, one of these uh, monoclonal antibody, you know, antibodies that um, really, really lower the PCSK9 inhibitors, you can get the LDL into the 40s and 50s. People still have large amounts of heart attacks and you know you can get the LDL to very low numbers, but they still have trillions of LDL molecules in their body. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy yeah. to me. The paradigm doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you know, once again, is that even if we take the literature, you know, for what it is, if we look at statin drugs and primary prevention trials, secondary prevention trials, and we take the results for what they are, and we can go conspiracy and say, well, you know what, this is this is a a hundreds of, of billions of dollars industries and they can easily fudge the data. You've done research, I've done research. Uh, you can easily pay someone to check off a different box and stuff like that. But let, let's say the data is true for what it is. It's not about how you look at statin primary prevention trials about how we lower heart attack risk from 5% to 4%. It's about how do we make it 0%? And we know that they fail in that model uh, dramatically. Uh, it's it's not about how we can again improve you know mortality by small numbers. That's not good enough. It's not good enough for me. Uh, it's not good enough for my family. It wasn't good enough for my father. Again, we have to really understand the best way to live. And that's number one. Number two, let me say this, and I know that uh, you know you you fully understand this very well. Is that whenever people are kind of make, you know critical about certain dietary studies, again they're using old time calculations, old time methodology total cholesterol, total LDL, total HDLs. They're not looking at particle numbers. They're not looking at particle sizes. Uh, they're not doing things like the ApoB, ApoA ratio, which is a linear correlation. It's like as ApoB, ApoA goes up, so does heart attack risk. And that is, that is infinitely more predictive than, than when you look at total cholesterol or total LDL, HDL. Uh, when you look at that particular ApoB, ApoA ratio, that's really the key. So I suggest all people get that number uh, checked. And when you do these dietary changes, lifestyle changes, that's really the, the, the marker that you wanna follow. You wanna have a lot of ApoAs, not quite as many ApoBs, and that's gonna generate your best uh, outcomes. Because when you have those less ApoBs, that just means you have a lot less of these small dense LDL particles, you have a lot less of VLDLs as, as well. So make sure you get that part, that number checked at ApoB, ApoA ratio. And ApoA is the apolipoprotein that's on HDL. So here we're starting to, I think, make this a more comprehensive assessment. My concern with mainstream medicine and cardiology in general, but mainstream medicine because most of mainstream medicine feels this way, is that it's very LDL myopic. It's completely LDL centric. As you know, when people go on ketogenic diets or they go on carnivore diets, or even when they go on paleolithic diets, perhaps, in a lot of people, that LDL might go up. But what's also gonna go up is the APOA because your HDL is gonna go up. And what's gonna go down is your triglycerides. And that's gonna be reflected in a VLDL, which is dropping, and et cetera. But so often I hear people send me these questions. I get this every day on Instagram in my DMs, and I always say, like, I can't give medical advice, but read my book because it's in there. And to anyone who's listening to this who sent me this question on, Inst on Instagram, you know, I did a carnivore diet. My LDL went to 180, but my HDL is now 85 milligrams per deciliter, and my triglycerides are 65 milligrams per deciliter. I think, look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Get, like, 
Dr. Wolfson is, is, is suggesting an ApoA to ApoB ratio, look at your HDL relative to ApoB. Look at your HDL relative to LDL. You'll see the HDL go up. And this is what mainstream medicine and mainstream cardiologists are missing is that they're just looking at LDL in a vacuum. And we can't interpret LDL in a vacuum. It makes no sense because LDL needs to be interpreted in a contextual basis. And so I'll share a couple of things from my book, um, which I think illustrate this very well. This is a little bit of a complex uh, issue, but um, if we look at Framingham, and again, this is guys, this is all in the carnivore code. You can go pre-order the second edition now. And I know Dr. Wolfson talks about it in his book, The, Primal, or the Paleocardiologist. This is the Framingham study. So this is an epidemiology study, and we're looking at CAD risk by LDL. That looks scary, right? Increased risk of coronary artery disease, increasing risk of LDL. But this is just all comers in the Framingham risk study. What if we then stratify this and incorporate something like what Dr. Wolfson is suggesting here? What if we look at the ApoA, which is the HDL, which is the apolipoprotein on HDL, and we stratify this? Look at how different these curves look when we take a look at the HDL relative to the LDL. This is, not, this is essentially what you are suggesting here. What we are suggesting, this is HDL relative to LDL. And in people who have HDL, which is low, a proxy for insulin resistance, a low ApoB, a low ApoA, excuse me, the, the risk of heart attacks increases as your LDL goes up. If you have a robust HDL, 65 or 85, there's essentially no increase in your risk or a negligible risk as your LDL goes up. So there's a very different story here. The point of this graphic is to say your HDL matters. And the reason your HDL matters is because your insulin sensitivity matters. And LDL must be interpreted in a context. It cannot be interpreted in a vacuum. That is just such a striking illustration to me that, that just to interpret LDL in a vacuum is to be so myopic and to miss this whole thing. I mean, um, yeah. I, I think that, yeah, it's crazy. Well, you know, a few years ago, it, uh, you know, the, there were guidelines that were put out there that essentially were telling cardiologists not even to check the lipids anymore. It was just a matter of kind of, you know, doing their, doing their calculations as far as, you know, what, what their overall risk is and therefore right. who should be on moderate dose of statins, who should be on high dose of statins. And I know you were around this as well. And I had the same thinking is like, hey, just, uh, you know, put the statins in the drinking water. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, to me, and I get these questions all the time as well, and whether they go carnivore, keto, paleo, and their LDL goes up, I'm like, I, I, I don't even check LDLs anymore. I don't check L. I only check the ApoB, ApoA ratio. I check when it comes to lipids, obviously, and I check uh, I try glycerides, and then, of course, LP, little a, and then getting on to the markers of inflammation and all the other stuff that we check. But as far as as far as total cholesterol, I could I could care less. I could care less about HDL, about about total LDL. It's just me. I just tell people to you know, as long. It, it's so easy, and every laboratory you know is doing this in the world. You know, Quest, LabCorp. You don't have to go to a fancy lab to have this done. They'll calculate. They'll order the ApoB, ApoA, and just use that uh, as your marker, and then, and then use that as a before and after trial on what happens, you know, with, with your lipids. And I think just about every single time we see improvement in that ratio. And that's, that's the most important thing. So I think maybe this would be a great time just to ask you what labs could people get from your perspective to really give them a sense of their cardiovascular risk. If you don't want to order a standard lipid panel, just run through those one time so people will know, and we'll put this in the show notes because people are always asking me, what labs do I get? And we're sort of talking about more advanced lipid analysis, but as you're saying, all the labs will do this. So what would you get to really get a sense of somebody's cardiovascular risk? Well, you know, and, and really, you know, let me touch on this. I think one of the next holy grails as far as uh, advanced cardiac testing is going to be the functionality of the HDL, that cholesterol efflux capacity on how well that HDL functions, because there's data that shows people with very high levels of HDL, they're actually producing dysfunctional HDLs that aren't doing their job to go around as an antioxidant, to go after uh, excess cholesterol that was deposited in the periphery that's no longer being utilized and to bring that back uh, to the liver for reprocessing. So stay tuned for testing that offers that cholesterol efflux capacity and then hopefully we can get um, a little more standardized. But there is there are some companies that are doing that. 
But again, back to the lipids, ApoB, ApoA ratio, check the triglycerides, look at LP little. I think those factors regarding lipids are clearly the most important things. And then hopefully when cholesterol efflux capacity and HDL function comes out, we'll be able to look at that as well. And then you want to do a full smattering of, of markers of inflammation. So HSCRP, phospholipase A2, uh, myeloporn oxidized LDL is very important. And then there's other ones you could do, do isoprostanes. Uh, there's, there's, you know, I, IL-6, IL-1A, uh, you know, different interleukins you can check for. And I think HSCRP, phospholipase A2, oxidized, oxidized LDL, I think those are really good markers for you to, to look at. And where statins, where the benefit probably comes in for statins is not in dramatically lowering the, the number of LDL uh, particles, uh, it's in their anti-inflammatory effect. And it just shows you that inflammation is the problem. Well, if inflammation is the problem, the answer is not a pharmaceutical to suppress inflammation, whether it's steroids or chemotherapy or statin drugs. The answer is finding the source of the inflammation and removing it. That's really what the, you know, what the key is when it comes to that. But I, I love checking to listen to homocysteine, vitamin D levels. Again, vitamin D levels being low is not a, is not a reason for you to start vitamin D supplementation. It's a marker that tells us you're not getting enough sunshine, so you want to make sure you get enough sunshine. Omega-3 levels are not necessarily a recommendation for you to go start omega-3 supplements. Again, it's that you got to eat a lot more seafood. And then I think there's so many other factors that I do as far as intracellular vitamins, minerals, glutathione levels, CoQ10 levels. Um, you know, I love testing intracellular K2. We know that K2 keeps calcium in the bones and out of the arteries, leads to coronary artery calcification reversal. So what is your level of intracellular K2? Have you tested it? The answer, of course, no. 99.99% of cardiologists have never even heard of the fact that you can test for intracellular K2. And then there's mold mycotoxins, environmental toxins. Uh, you mentioned the work by Stephanie Seneff and, and, and her her understanding of how glyphosate leads to disease. Well, have you tested your glyphosate levels uh, recently? Yeah, you can test them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super valuable. Thank you. Yeah, I think that so much of that is is critical. Uh, I'll just uh, add a couple of editorial comments there. I, in people who are eating carnivore paleo diets, I see coenzyme Q10 levels that are higher than I've ever seen, <laughs> like massively high coenzyme Q10 levels, which is a very, very good thing in my opinion. And, um, you know, I think that the, the K2, you know, it's so crazy is I went on the doctor's TV show and many people watching this or listening to this podcast may have seen me on that show. It was a complete ambush. It was a total setup. Um, and I, 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 they need to let me back on to actually have a real debate with them. It was more of a Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, uh, snow job than anything else. But, um, the, they didn't even, one of their criticisms was that there was no vitamin K in animal foods. And I thought, are you crazy? I, I fear that most physicians, and maybe many physicians listening to this are the very savvy kind, but I fear that most mainstream physicians don't know the difference between vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. And that's something I talk about in my book in great detail that in studies like the Rotterdam Heart Study and many other epidemiology studies, admittedly, um, vitamin K2 levels, higher vitamin K2 levels, which we get from animal foods, not plant foods. We can talk about MK7 and natto, but you know we get vitamin K2 from animal foods. And the more vitamin K2 we get, the highest tertial was greater than 32 micrograms per day, which is a small amount of vitamin K2, had a much, a significantly reduced risk of coronary heart disease and atherosclerotic, or I should say calcific aortic sclerosis. And yet, how many physicians understand the difference between vitamin K1 and vitamin K2? Because K1, which is only from plants, is not associated with any reduction in cardiovascular risk. But K2 is, like you're saying. And so yes, testing your vitamin K2 would be critical to know in the situation to really understand your cardiovascular risk, among other things. It's just, this is, I love what you're doing here. I think this is the future of cardiology. In terms of that, that cholesterol efflux, um, test, the HDL functionality test. Does Cleveland Heart Lab do that? I think they might have developed that recently. What labs are you aware of that do that test now? Um, I'm blanking on the name and actually they sent me um, uh, the 
the MD who is the medical director of the company, they sent me some kits. I had the testing done, so I may have to report back to you as far as um, the name of the company. I'm, I'm blanking on it, but I don't think, you know, it's not Cleveland Heart Lab. And if other laboratories, I think they're using surrogate markers than actually doing a deep dive into, uh, you know, the functionality of that HDL. I think they're, again, they're using other parameters to kind of come up with the surrogate number of what it is, as opposed to actually directly testing the HDL functionality. So I'll have to you know, report back on that. But I think that's where, again, that's going to be an exciting area of, of research on that because, uh, you know, again, those people with really high HDLs, I think it, again, it's just, you know, the body is recognizing that the HDLs it's making are not working and therefore it's just trying to produce more in order to overcome for that, for that deficit. But, you know, and back to your experience on the doctors, man, let me just tell you that uh, I, I, I understand what you went through because when I was on CNN in 2015, again, it was that total ambush. They've got their agenda. You realize that um, you realize quickly that you're not part of what their agenda is. So yeah, they'll do anything to vilify you, you know, and and and, and break down your argument. And of course, always after the fact, we're like, oh, I should have said this or I could have said that. But even if you did, then that's where they edit out your comments. Or, yes. You know, while Dr. Paul Saladino is is giving all this interest, you know, you're 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 speaking all this information, and then what they'll do is they'll do like an image over. So they'll put like an image over your face. So, uh, so, and, and the image of course is all their statistics now that people all of a sudden they tune out what you're saying and they just look at the visual and the visual is, you know, low fat saves millions of lives. And it turns out that eating, uh, 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 Cheerios uh, is great for cholesterol. So therefore eat that. I mean, so they'll, they'll always uh, obscure our, and, and alienate our message, uh, at the behest of their, uh, their message, their agenda, and their advertisers, really. After I went on that show, I learned that they were funded by plant-based groups and vegan groups and vegetarian groups. And David Katz is associated with, you know, Dr. David Katz, who's a plant-based vegetarian advocate, is associated with them. And so they clearly have an agenda that they're not disclosing to people. And um, yeah, so I want to share a few things that I found while you were talking that I think are interesting. Here's, this is Quest Diagnostics saying, here's the HDL function test. So maybe, this is from December 5th, 2019. So maybe, um, maybe Quest is going to have this test soon, which would be really cool. And then I found uh, an opinion paper in Lipidology, time to ditch HDLC as your measure of HDL function. I, I have to agree with you. I think that <clears throat> to me, this would be a sea change because if, it would I think it would clearly, clearly show who's at risk for coronary artery disease, and it would shift the focus away from LDL. And my fear is that it will not happen because of that, that this test will be vilified or not used, because um, it will clearly, if you can do a test like this, that's really going to tell you in black and white terms, independent of LDL, what your cardiovascular risk is, what your metabolic health is, this is going to be very challenging for the multi-billion dollar statin pharmaceutical industry. So just, that would be super, super interesting. Um, I, uh, 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 yeah, uh, real quick, Paul, I, I did pull up uh, the company actually, and I'll, I'll spell it out uh, uh, for you. It's R-E-L-I-G-E-N-D-X.com. Uh, uh, it's Relegan, uh, D DX is the company that I'm familiar with, and I believe that's the sample product that I got to do that testing. I finally got around to doing that, and that's what they're doing for, for HDL functionality. So maybe if people are interested, they can kind of go to that website and kind of snoop around and, and get the latest and greatest from, from them and what they're doing and their proprietary uh, technology for, for that HDL function. And, and it may be that, yeah, one of these bigger companies will come out and buy a company like this, and it may be what, the, like you said, whether it's Quest or LabCorp, you know, what they're looking at uh, pulling into their umbrella. So, I there's so much that I want to share, but I I had saved these slides for later in this podcast, but I think that they're very relevant right now at this moment. So, I've been thinking a lot about this in the setting of coronavirus and why coronavirus discussions have not been focused on 
insulin resistance, metabolic health, obesity, and more on vitamin D. And my suspicion or concern was that this may have been because um, the, the pharmaceuticals are sponsoring TV. And so I did a little research and just off the top of my, just really briefly, this is from 2018. And this is a website called Fierce Pharma, which is clearly pro pharma. And they're saying in another record year for pharma TV ads, spending soars to 3.7 billion in 2018, <laughs> right? Now, I, would, I am very curious what pharma spending has been during coronavirus and what pharma spending is in 2019 and 2020. And my fear is that this is a big reason that we are not being heard, that, that so many of these things are not being heard. Because why would you talk about insulin resistance being a major risk factor for coronavirus when pharma is, is, talking, is, is having all the commercials between the Fox News or CNN or whatever news network you like? I heard um, someone told me recently on another podcast, they heard someone say that Humira, which is um, a biologic agent, it's an, a use for autoimmune disease, is is a very, it has a lot of bad side effects. And um, it's a really strong drug that's going to be powerful for your autoimmune disease, but going to have massively bad side effects as, um, as this monoclonal antibody. Um, and this is the most, uh, this is the most like widely used drug this is or the most profitable drug that has come out is Humira. So this is a TNF alpha blocker. And if you look at the side effects, they are massive, serious infections, hepatitis B, nervous system, blood pressure, heart failure, immune reactions, lupus-like, psoriasis, neuroworsening, liver problems, um, symptoms related to tuberculosis infections. So it turns out that shutting off the immune system by using a TNF alpha, which is a cytokine uh, monoclonal antibody, is a really bad idea. But Humira is making billions of dollars. And if you yeah. watch TV, I don't watch TV much, but I need to do some research. There, I've heard from people, there are tons of Humira ads. There are tons of ads for these biologics now for autoimmune illnesses like psoriasis, whether it's plaque psoriasis, all these things. It's all pharmaceutical ads. Obviously, that's hyperbole. It's a lot of pharmaceutical ads. And in fact, they are so proud of this that, that they're sharing it on their media saying, hey, we're spending billions of dollars on, um, on these ads. But you know, this to me is just crazy uh, and really speaks to some, oh, some seemingly nefarious things. New York Times 2019, think you're seeing more drug ads on TV? You are, and here's why. And if you read this article, actually, this is 2017, Jack. If you read the article, you see it right here. TV ad spending by pharmaceutical companies has more than doubled in the past four years. This is 2017, making it the second fastest growing category on television during that time. Right. And so the reason is because the FDA allowed these ads to be less uh, specific about the side effects because this is this is what's crazy here it says you you have the benefits of the drug you have the specific specific patient population the drug is intended to treat you have the dosing mechanism how is administered all these things are supposed to be there um, it's comprehending all that information that is a tall order for consumers there may be a cure for that in 2017 the FDA released a study suggesting that a shorter list of side effects including only those the agency described as serious and actionable, help people remember the drugs, risks, and benefits. What's, what's happening here is that in 2017, the FDA said you can be more lax about what side effects you tell people on television. <laughs> can you believe this? And, well, and, and really, and this is what the, the cardiologists and the medical doctors are getting detailed on as well. Like, the, you know, the drug rep comes in, they bring in the lunch, they bring in the coffee, whatever they're going to do. They give them the pens or whatever other techniques they're going to use. And it's not as bad as it used to be back in the day. I mean, you know, 
we went on a family of Merck, uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals. We went to Hawaii, all expenses paid in the entire family. And, you know, again, the airfare, the food, different excursions that we did. My father spoke for Merck for one hour. Everything was paid for. So it's not quite as bad as it used to be. But again, you know, the, the medical doctors, they, they, they don't have a lot of time. They're seeing a ton of patients. They get detailed very quickly. These are all the glories of the drugs, not really talking about the side effect profile. So everybody moves on. And then if you talk about where things are at right now, as far as pharmaceutical advertising, um, you know, I was mortified when I turned on the TV back in 2015 to see all the stuff that was going on uh, around the time of my controversy. And it was, yeah, there was just so many pharmaceutical ads. I was just stunned because again, I, I don't spend my time on television looking at this stuff, but you know, this has creeped into other forms of social media. Take fast forward right now with Corona, there's over 100 companies that are trying to come up with vaccines and pharmaceuticals uh, geared towards Corona. So the profit profitability of this is, is again, just so, so high and they're all racing to come out with something that of course is gonna be untested, un unproven, just like all the other vaccines are. This will be, be no different and just as dangerous. But the number one um, uh, company as far as revenue when, in pharmaceuticals is Pfizer. And Pfizer's number one pharmaceutical is a vaccine, uh, which, is, which is Prevnar. So, and, and get this as a statistic. 92,000 people work for Pfizer, 92,000. And they're not in the research division because the bench research actually takes place in universities. And then Pfizer, which is really just a marketing company, like Merck said, so th these are just marketing companies and you just showed the data of how they do the marketing. Well, that's mark that's on TV. There's also print. There's also social media, and then how they send out their field reps to get out into the doctors' offices. They, these are just marketing companies. Is is all that they are? Ninety two thousand employees, and that's just for, for Pfizer. It's scary, and you know what's so hard for this? Oh, hard about this for me is that it's kind of like we said about Western medicine. And, and maybe, you'll, maybe you'll disagree with this and I'll, I'll welcome your opinion too, but I'll just offer mine. I don't think that pharmaceuticals are all bad. <laughs> you know, I think that there, that there have been pharmaceuticals that have been helpful. Um, when I, for instance, when I cut my hand open on my foil board, the physician used lidocaine, right? And that lidocaine made it a lot less painful for me to have this procedure. And when people go into the hospital and they have to have anesthesia, it, there, I think that there are benefits to pharmaceuticals, just like there are some benefits to mainstream Western medicine and the acute care. But I certainly see the downsides. And as you're pointing out so astutely, the, the, some of the things don't actually add up. 92,000 employees with Pfizer, the vast majority, I mean, probably 98% of those people are our, our sales reps and marketing and business people, those are not researchers. <laughs> These are marketing companies. And so, yes, I think there are benefits to pharmaceutical molecules. As I've said in my book, but yes, I think there are benefits to uh, molecules found in plants at a medicinal rather than a food level. That's just my opinion. Um, but I think we have to be very careful about this and realize, as you're saying, these are not all good. And the pharmaceutical companies are in some ways very similar to news media. There, I want to believe in my heart of hearts that pharmaceutical CEOs and business people really want to help people, but I can't help but suspect, and I hope to be proven wrong on this, I cannot help but suspect that their main job is profit, that these are businesses, just like CNN, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, the media, their job is to get you to pay attention to the TV. Pharmaceuticals, their job is to make a profit. Now, again, I know there are people listening to this who take pharmaceuticals, who have found them to be helpful. And I think there are some pharmaceuticals that can be helpful in certain situations. I know I've heard you say on certain podcasts that you sometimes use selected pharmaceuticals with the intention of then getting patients off of them 
in the short term. I know we, we talked about statins. I don't know if this has changed, but I heard you say you don't really use statins. I would not prescribe a statin, but I heard you say on Mark Bell's podcast that sometimes you'll use antihypertensives with the intention of getting someone off those drugs. So this is not to say that all pharmaceuticals are bad. The pharmaceutical industry is completely evil, but they're certainly tempted to be evil by hundreds of billions of profits. And when, when there is what appears to be trillions of dollars on the line for a coronavirus vaccine, I worry about human greed in that situation. I do, I do. And with regard to vaccines, I think that um, this is such a controversial topic. Um, I, I think you and I may differ slightly here, but I think that we, we do see eye to eye. I think that the way that humans are living now and um, in, in how closely we're living together, um, I do think that some vaccinations in the past, and feel free to disagree with me on this if you, if you feel like you do. Um, I think that some vaccinations in the past may have been helpful, but I also think that we cannot ignore as humans that vaccinations appear to harm some children and how do we balance both of those things, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think that vaccinations are necessarily dangerous, though I appreciate your point that um, the best way to, to be um, strong in the face of an infection would be to eat well and to have a strong immune system without a vaccine. But my goodness, um, vaccines do seem to harm some children. And uh, I just don't understand how anyone could ignore that. I'm not saying that I'm saying I'm not saying that means we need to do away with all vaccines. I think it's a nuanced approach, but I will also offer you an ability, an opportunity to speak your mind here because I think we may be slightly different. I'll just add before I finish that my sister has kids. I don't have kids, and and it was a struggle in our family. She asked me for my advice. I thought I don't want to overstep. They're not my kids, um, but I, I can imagine having children. It's a it's a challenging decision. I think you've spoken out about. These, these things that are in vaccines that could be harmful. And I think that um, uh, I agree with you there that the adjuvants, the aluminum, the mercury in vaccines can be harmful as well. But I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about vaccines. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole if you don't want to. I just wanted to give a platform there so that you could say your piece if you wanted to. Yeah, I think, you know, once again, it's that, you know, it, if we can tell anything to the listeners, it's just question authority. Just read as much as possible, become your own advocate, because you can't ask your pediatrician. It's the pediatrician's job to vaccinate. Like that's their job. You know, you don't, you don't ask a, a, an owner of a McDonald's franchise about the health and quality of McDonald's. It's their job to sell you burgers. So you don't ask the pediatrician about vaccines because again, that's their job. If they don't vaccinate, then they can go find something else to do because they're not going to be a pediatrician. So there's a lot of different books that are written also on vaccines, and we've got videos and stuff that we've done as well. Again, the whole purpose is to boost up the health of the human body, not tear it down by injecting other chemicals, by artificially generating an immune response. And then finally, let me say, if the, if the guidelines and the pediatricians and the pharmaceutical companies, if they want to inject newborn babies on day one with the hepatitis B vaccine and all of its loaded aluminum and you talk about you know molar uh, uh, you know concentrations of, of particles if they're willing to inject newborn babies with the hepatitis B vaccine they're willing to do anything because you don't get hepatitis B uh, uh, as a baby you get it when you sleep with prostitutes or use IV drugs healthy people that get according to the CDC, that get hepatitis B will actually clear the virus out of their system within six months, 95% of the time um, in all comers, let alone if you're a healthy person. And then let me tell you about, uh, as far as aluminum, when you get down to an atomic level, the number of aluminum particles that are inside of uh, the hepatitis B vaccine you know, it's like 225 micrograms. Well, how much is that on an atomic level? It is 11 uh, times 10 to the 21st number of aluminum particles. That's equal to double the amounts of grain of sand on every beach on earth just gets injected into a newborn baby. And I've written stuff about how Aluminum destroys lysosomal function, which is the cellular garbage can. And if you don't break down your cellular garbage, you're done. You're done. And aluminum inhibits that, that proton pump. Aluminum also inhibits the proton pump in the stomach. So therefore, less stomach acid production, all the effects of that. So 
you know, I mean, Paul, I would just, you know, kind of throw it back at you and I, yeah, we don't need to sit here and argue about, you know, about, you know, childhood infections and stuff like that. And I would just say, what, what vaccine are we really looking to use? What, what are we, are we worried about chicken pox? Should we be worried about measles, uh, mumps and rubella? Men who, and this is from the journal Atherosclerosis in 2016, uh, men and women were studied and they looked at those that had a natural history of measles and mumps infection and men who had the history of measles and mumps infection had a 29% lower heart attack risk. So there is value in these childhood infections and we should be embracing them as opposed to trying to uh, chemically uh, obliterate uh, you know, the possibility of, of, of children getting these infections. I heard you say that on another podcast. I didn't have a chance to look into it, but that is a fascinating thing. I think it's a complex issue. and. One of the things that I talked to Mark Bell about previously, I had a lot of conversations with Mark Bell recently, is that I feel like all of the monikers now are so unjust and unfair. You know, I, I really, I, I think it's so unfair when people call people anti-vaxxers or 5G deniers or, you know, or, or keto zealots or carnivore zealots. It's like, I think that, wait a minute, we're all just trying to offer an opinion and to put people into a wastebasket like that or a group and say, he's an anti-vaxxer or she's an anti-vaxxer or she's a climate denier. It, it just really bothers me. I mean, aren't people's opinions valuable? Like ultimately what we're just asking is how do we keep ourselves and our children healthy? And I think that should be a very safe thing to do, to ask questions about that. And I appreciate that you're asking those questions and I think it's a challenging topic all of these things are such challenging topics. And I think if anyone is listening to this and, um, you know, and, and hears those terms and has a visceral reaction, I would just challenge you, you know, to think like, you know, do you, have you listening to this done the research yourself or are you listening to the media? How much of what we are taking as fact in our head is, is related to our own programming versus our own our own research. And I love what you said there, educate yourself. You know, I'm not here, Jack is not here to, um, um, to tell you guys what to think. We're here to share ideas and to challenge you to think for yourself, which is what we should all be doing because that is how things move forward ultimately. So yeah, and I, well, yeah, I just, I think that well, the vaccine thing is so controversial and so heated and I've just tried to diffuse it on my podcast and say, hey, there's interesting ideas on both sides. We need to be sensible about this. We need to not ignore the potential downsides to vaccines. And we also need to really think about these in terms of the way they may have helped humans. And so I, I appreciate both sides of the equation. I, and I, I love what you said earlier. And I think there's a lot of subtlety here that we, can't ign that we shouldn't ignore, that we should actually highlight and bring to the forefront, which is that when a patient comes to your office, my office, any physician's office, if we give that patient a vitamin D pill or a statin, we're essentially putting a Band-Aid on something and not treating the root cause. And, and, and you, I think, accurately pointed out that that could be killing someone, <laughs> you know, that could be harmful to someone. If we give people the wrong impression that giving a pill is enough, you know, that giving a statin is enough to reverse your coronary artery disease, then they're not gonna actually understand what the real cause of it is, or no one's gonna ask the questions about the, what the real cause of coronary artery disease is. If we give someone a vitamin D pill, this is my concern, that if we give someone a vitamin D pill, they're not gonna go in the sun. They're not gonna remember they need to go in the sun. They're not gonna understand that the sun has benefits independent of a vitamin D pill. And you know, I tweeted the president, I tweeted President Trump. He didn't respond, but surprise. <laughs> you know, I said, Donald, hydroxychloroquine is not the answer. Fix your metabolic health. I think anyone looking at the president, whether you agree with his policies or not, can tell that Donald Trump is not metabolically healthy. And by Donald Trump using hydroxychloroquine, I fear that the message to the American public was, here's a drug that will protect you against coronavirus. Well, that's not treating the root cause. I think that drugs can have side effects, which we know, and you highlight in your book. I mean, one of the things that was very striking for me was 
some of the data on aspirin side effects, which we can go into in a second. And you have a whole chapter on the failure of pharma, which I think is really interesting. So drugs can have side effects, but the more insidious side effect of a drug could be that by giving someone a drug, we're not challenging them to understand the root cause. We're sort of making it okay. We're giving them uh, a quote unquote opiate where it's almost propaganda. We're saying, here's a drug which will fix your problem. You don't need to worry about the root cause. And this is what I worry about with our coronavirus vaccine. And I agree with you completely here that there's always, we can't, this strategy is philosophically flawed. You don't just go through life vaccinating for infection after infection after infection after infection. You, you might say, say a coronavirus vaccine gets developed and it's completely safe. Well, that's going to protect someone against coronavirus until the virus mutates, but it's not going to correct them about, against the next pandemic of another infectious agent, presuming coronavirus doesn't mutate, because you didn't correct the root cause, because you did not correct the problem, which was generally in the first place, nutritional inadequacy and underlying metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance. So I, that's a little rant. I'm sorry, I'm soapboxing, but I just think that what you said earlier was so key and it kind of ties it all together that that, this, that the strategy of Western medicine that bothers me most and the reason that I've chosen my path is because I think the paradigm is wrong and the paradigm is pharmaceutical based and symptom focused. And that is not treating the root cause. And if we don't treat the root cause, we're just gonna, we have this endless machine which generates profits, which might be good for some people, but you're never going to prevent the next infection with your current change of action or lifestyle Unless, and you're never gonna prevent the future infections unless you change your current lifestyle. We can't do it with drugs. We can't just stack drugs on each other. We can't stack vaccinations. And again, you know, um, super controversial topic, but we just can't do that to people. And I think that's doing people a great disservice. So any thoughts well, about that? We, yeah, I mean, how do we best protect our bodies? I mean, again, you know, it, it's just man-made, Man-made, um, man-made and natural causes of illness are so prevalent in society. So you can say, well, listen, there's viruses going around, there's bacteria you know, going around, there's fungus, so many different things. There's mold mycotoxins, there's environmental toxins, uh, you know, glyphosate, phthalates, uh, plastics, parabens. And we can say that there's all the EMF toxicity, all the blue light toxicity, and we can talk about geoengineering and the poisoned environment how do we best protect ourselves? It's not going to be through any kind of pharmaceutical driven approach. It's going to be giving ourselves the right food and the right lifestyle and avoiding those toxins. That's the only way we can protect ourselves. Uh, by definition, we're not going to have a studied vaccine for coronavirus anytime soon, although they will release the vaccine to the masses by the end of 2020. Again, what are the you know, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials that they are going to do over the long term with any of these vaccine choices? Number one, number two, always look at what they use for placebo because if you look at all the HPV data, the placebo in the HPV trials all contain aluminum. So it wasn't even a placebo. And that's right. exactly what they're going to do right now. They're going to have, you know, they'll have a, you know, one vaccine. They're going to call placebo. That's going to be loaded up with all the other adjuvants that are so damaging. And then they'll have what they call the active with all the same damaging adjuvants. And then also with the active uh, antigens, uh, you know, that are in there for this. And then they'll bill it as safe. And then now, because so many states are going towards mandatory vaccinations, now they've got carte blanche to inject everybody. And We'll, we'll, we'll see the outcomes. And, you know, listen, like you mentioned before, I've been and I've spoken at these autism conferences. I've, we've hosted our own conferences. And all you have to meet are these dozens and hundreds of parents of vaccine injured children that say, my child was normal one day, received a slew of vaccines, and the next day they weren't talking or behavioral disorders. You don't need any studies or any literature to confirm that. You talk to these moms and dads that know their child so close and so well, who saw the change, and yet they went to the pediatrician, the pediatrician was like, oh no, they were always on the spectrum. You just didn't know, you didn't realize it. And that is really an insult to the parents uh, on this one, so. Yeah, it's, um, I like, yeah. I liked what you said earlier. You know, a pediatrician's job is to vaccinate, <laughs> so. 
you know, you, that may not be the best person to ask. You got to do your own research and make your own decision. And, um, you know, we're not telling you what to do in this podcast, just like your cardiologist job is kind of to give you stats. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, that's the guidelines. That's how they make their money. Uh, you know, one of the quotes in my book I use from uh, Upton Sinclair, which is his book called The Jungle from the early 1900s in the Chicago stockyards. It's hard to get a man to understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. So again, you can't talk to the cardiologist about a holistic approach because it is their job to do procedures and prescribe pharmaceuticals. You can't talk to a pediatrician and ask for a different opinion, although there are a few that are now speaking out. Dr. Larry Pilevsky is, is really at the forefront of that, and he's been fighting the fight you know, for, for 20 plus years. Again, when, when the pediatrician pays all of their bills and they pay their malpractice and they pay their school loans, again, and, and everything that they've been taught, they're not going to give up on this and say, wow, I've been poisoning all these children. The, the dentist who's been putting in mercury amalgams for 40 years isn't going to sleep well if he or she thinks that they've been poisoning children for all these years with mercury amalgams. Um, and a parent as well is going to fight you to the bitter end like Aaron Burnett was fighting me and so many others have as well in the sense that, okay, I damaged my child. I don't, uh, you say I damaged my child. I don't want to believe that. I can't accept that. I know I didn't do the research, but I can't accept that I may have damaged my child. So therefore, if I may have damaged my child, you're going to damage yours as well. And then, and, and Paul, let, let me say this too before I forget this, is that how many people are employed? We talked about pharmaceutical employees. How many people are employed by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services? How many people are employed by the State Department of Health, the County Department of Health, the school boards, et cetera, whose job is to make up laws, whether coronavirus or anything else, whose job is to make up the vaccine recommendations. It is their sole job to you know, perform these tasks. I mean, and it's like where we're at with Corona right now when there's no science except for negative around the masks and about you know, the, the social distancing, these things are all just made up in people's minds who, who they work for some department of health and then their supervisor says, okay, we need a list of 10 strategies to, you know, to reduce the spread. So these people all sit down, they just start writing down laws and how this becomes commonplace. I've been on some of these calls for the State Department of Health in Arizona and in Colorado, and they're, they're open to the public. Now, not many public people are listening to it. And you get on these calls and you listen to 75 men and women all talk about the glories of vaccines and mandatory vaccines because it is their job to promote that method. And again, if it is your job, then that's what you're gonna do. And that's, that's, that's the fight that we're up against constantly. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance there. And you can imagine evolutionarily, if, if, an, idea, if an idea were central to the subsistence or persistence of your tribe, you would fight for that idea. <laughs> even, if, even in the face of almost undeniable evidence that that idea were wrong. Um, we're, we're tribal humans, and we, um, though I've argued against tribalism in the, sec in the setting of coronavirus and in the idea of the way that tribalism limits our thinking as humans, we need to realize that tribalism is one of our mental limitations. And I think if humans feel threatened uh, in terms of their job, in terms of their, um, their livelihood, uh, in terms of their central ideology to keeping their job, that's going to be a very challenging thing for them to move out of. So that's, that's a really insightful comment. Man, we could just go on forever. There's a bunch of stuff I want to share. I'm just going to go through a lightning round, if that's okay, to share with some stuff with the, with the listener and the watcher. Um, so this is a study that uh, I found from your book, The Association of Aspirin Use with Age-Related Macular Degeneration. I thought this one was really interesting. I mean, we think of aspirin as a pretty darn benign drug, but it's acetylsalicylic acid. It's from a willow bark of a tree. So... The little carnivore, the carnivore doctor in me goes, 
isn't that interesting? Something from willow bark in a tree maybe isn't good for humans. As you point out in the book, the number needed to treat with aspirin is only slightly lower than the number needed to harm. And aspirin also raises uric acid. It worsens kidney function. It can worsen macular degeneration and cause hearing loss. And yet it's treated as a completely benign thing and recommended for everyone when we don't really have great data in terms of aspirin for primary prevention. And by the idea that the number needed to treat is really only slightly less than the number needed to harm, you point out in the book that though you may prevent some cardiac events, you're causing a heck of a lot of GI bleeding with aspirin as well. It's just one example of sort of the dangers of pharma unless they're questioned. Um, earlier in the podcast, we talked a little bit about some of the statin trials. I just want to go ahead and show people those on the screen. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul, you know, yeah. while you're loading that up real quick, let me just say that also in the, you know, in the 2018 New England Journal of Medicine, which anybody would say is one of the top, you know, three or four sure. uh, oh. medical journals in the entire world, showed that people over the age of 70 who took yeah. aspirin for primary prevention actually had increased mortality rates. So I think that I, really puts kind of like death knell into, into the aspirin for primary prevention, certainly in older folks. And again, for younger people, again, the data is horrible. And fundamentally, we're, we're not sick because we're deficient in aspirin. Or that's, statin. That's the, that's the easiest way to put it. Or a statin or the blood pressure drugs or any, you know, I mean, you know, the Humeras and stuff like that. Can you shut down the immune system with that stuff? Yeah, but again, and people will talk about, oh, it saved their life and saved this and this. I mean, again, it never addressed the cause of what the issue is. And we're always about addressing the cause. Yeah, I like that. You know, um, coronary artery disease is not a statin deficiency. Depression is not... Uh, an antidepressant deficiency, you know, is not a Soloft deficiency in any way, shape, or form. Um, we you, we kind of mentioned some of these in passing. AFCAP, TexCAP study, I'll put these in the show notes. This one is primary prevention of acute coronary events with lovastatin in men and women. And really, the take-home from this study was that in primary prevention, there's really a very, very minuscule difference in when you give people a statin. These are people who have not had a coronary event and it leads to a number needed to treat of 63, which is pretty significant. And one of the things that we didn't talk about, but we'll have to talk about next time, is how underrepresented in the literature side effects from statins are. <laughs> and then, oh, by the way, in, the, in this trial, actually a few more people died in the statin group as far as overall mortality. Right, right. The all-cause mortality was higher in the statin group. And that's another thing that we should point out is that in a lot of these primary prevention statin trials, all-cause mortality is no different or worse in the statin group. The cardiovascular events change, but then there are more people who get the statin who commit suicide, violent deaths, depression, other deaths. So I talked about this in my book. You talk about it in yours. It's like, wait a minute. Well, let's talk about all-cause mortality. We can't just m massage the data. <laughs> That, I, I, that to me, that's the most important arbiter of, of everything exactly is that all cause mortality. I mean, it's one thing to have a heart attack. It's one thing to have, you know, to, to have some of these other, uh, other endpoints. But again, to me, the ultimate thing is, I mean, do, does the drug save lives or does it not? And in fact, there was the, uh, a trial that was published in 2017, which was called the all hat uh, uh, LLC, lipid lowering uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, uh, arm of that trial. And what that showed in people that took statin drugs for primary prevention, if they're older than 65, it led to an overall 18% increase in total mortality. For people who took statin drugs for primary prevention and they were older than 75, it was a 34% higher risk of total mortality in the all hat trial so go ahead and look that up scary stuff yeah here it is there it is thank you <laughs> <laughs> i got you i got you we'll put it in the show notes scary stuff with statins you guys scary stuff with statins and so not to belabor that but there are multiple other trials we'll put these in the show notes this is jupiter trial with crestor uh, and c-reactive protein also showing not a huge difference in primary prevention um and, and, and real quick, and it, and it wasn't, I mean, so, so in the Jupiter trial, what they found is that it didn't really matter what happened with your lipids. It was all about how the statin drug lowered your CRP as a marker of inflammation. And those are the people that got the benefit were the people that had the lowest amount of CRP reduction. But the answer is why is, or the question is, why is your CRP elevated? Exactly. And then the answer is not the statin. It's about how do we come up with the strategies 
to lower down CRP naturally uh, and by finding the cause of the elevation. And let me say this real quick about supplements too, so I make sure we get this out there. Supplements supplement the healthy lifestyle. And we can determine that based on, based on all the advanced testing, intracellular vitamins, minerals, stuff like that, because even with the best foods, there's still deficiencies, right? There's still deficiencies on what the grass-fed animals are eating as far as what's in the air, what's in the soil, what's in the water. There's so many man-made pollutants that are in all that stuff now. And then frankly, for me, for the first 35 years of my life, I've got a lot of catching up to do. For those people who are listening, that may be 50 or 65, you've got a lot of catching up to do from your previous exposures. And that's why I say I'm an unapologetic supplements pusher to help to dial in everything. Once we've done everything appropriately, that's when supplements can come in to help dial in the, the situation. And we'll get to this. I think we're going to, uh, at the end of the podcast, which we'll wrap up in a moment, we'll get to the way you eat. But I know you're a fan of organ meats. And in my mind, organ meats are the best supplement that we can use. <laughs> you know, liver, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas. These are the best supplements that we can use just because of the nutrient density in these organs and, you know, the way that they are going to um, complement the, the or minerals and vitamins and growth factors and peptides that we are finding in the muscle meat. Now, I, I love that you're saying this, and I, I just want to talk about this, and maybe this will be a good segue to a quick discussion of glyphosate, and then we'll wrap it up. You guys listening to this, you know that you're never going to get an hour-long podcast on my podcast because there's always too much to talk about. So maybe this is the second hour that you're listening to this podcast, but we'll, we'll try and be succinct here. But I do think that what's interesting is if you go to farms and you see how cows are raised, um, most, you know, there's no perfect soil on the face of the planet. There are some places in the world where there are better soils um, and less, and there are some places in the earth where there are less nutrient rich soils. And in order to combat that, farmers are pretty smart. They basically leave mineral buckets out for cows and sheep and ruminants, and the cows know which minerals to eat. So what happens, what's so interesting for me about eating animal foods is if you're eating animal foods from a well-raised source, from Belcampo, from white oak pastures, from a grass-fed, grass-finished regenerative farm, and they are doing this, they are leaving, quote, a supplement out for their animals because they realize the soil's not perfect. Um, and the, if, the, if the soil is selenium deficient, the, the animal can go to a trough, which is full of selenium, and eat the selenium. And so I think this is a really interesting and robust argument for eating animal foods for nutrient adequacy. And that if you are eating animal foods and you're eating nose to tail from a well-raised, grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised animal, I think it's much less likely that we are going to get nutrient deficiencies than if we are relying mostly on plants because plants can only grow in a soil. And if a soil is deficient in a mineral, that plant is going to be deficient in that mineral. There are many, many studies about selenium deficient soils, boron deficient soils, manganese. The soil quality you know, if you're relying on plants for the majority of your diet or the majority of your nutrients, the plants can be very deficient. But animals are a little smarter than that. And it's really cool the way that they're raised and especially eating nose to tail, which anyone who listens to my stuff will be familiar with as a concept. And I know that you eat organs too. That's why I think it's so important to get those vitamins and minerals from the organ meats. And I think that that really helps um, to combat this nutrient inadequacy. Well, and I think, and that's what I like so much about you and your message and, and what you're doing is that, again, I've spoken uh, paleo effects. You've been down there as well, you know, um, and, and some of these other different, you know, keto and paleo. And even what Atkins used, you know, used to say, I mean, Atkins was all about, you know, high fat, low carb, but he was shoving in soybean oil. So, uh, you know, you have to do things the right way. Yes. And again, that nose to tail eating of a healthy animal, that's the way to do it. This, this is not, okay, well, uh, you know, I'm going to take, you know, these meat bars, meat sticks, uh, all these other processed meats. Uh, that, that's not the healthy way to do it. But I, let me show you this picture from my, from my phone, and maybe your people can see that, uh, you know, right there. Sorry for the glare. Those are, those are sardines that are cooked in bacon grease. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, challenge, I challenge anybody, come up with a healthier food than a whole sardine. It contains everything that a sardine needs to come to life. It's got the sardine's brain and it's got the eyeballs and it's got its liver. It's got all its intestinal organs. 
It's got all those nutrients that are in there. You can't get any healthier than that, packed with omega-3s. So, I mean, I do love eating the grass-fed organs and stuff like that, and, you, and believe me, that, that is awesome. But again, that whole seafood right there, eating whole eggs, eating fish eggs, there's, there's nothing more nutritious than that. I mean, I, you know, you know, tell me if you disagree, Paul. I mean, how, how people could not live on, you know, just this and this alone for an entire lifetime. I mean, I just, I, I can't see any deficiency in anything on that picture. And, uh, and, I don't and, you know, Paul, and that stuff's cheap too. It's cheap because nobody wants to eat that. Yeah, it's true. And the nice thing about sardines is they're a small fish. So they're not going to bioaccumulate you know, heavy metals. But I think, yeah, eating nose to tail, whether it's a small fish that's low in heavy metals or eating an animal nose to tail, I think you could live on just that food. And that's kind of what I wrote my book, The Carnivore Code About. It's so interesting. And we'll get to that in a moment, you guys. Just want to share a few more things in the lightning round. I just have so much good stuff. I always want to pack into these podcasts. This goes back to <laughs> cholesterol and the point that cholesterol is valuable. Basically, the point of this study, which we'll put in the show notes, the effects of cholesterol on learning and memory, is that if you have lower cholesterol levels, you are not going to be as smart. <laughs> that's basically the take home. And that's been shown in this study and other studies. So that one is really interesting as well. Now, this is a study that I got from your book, higher antioxidant, lower cadmium concentrations and lower incidence of pesticide residues in organically grown crops. Obviously, both Dr. Wolfson and I are huge fans of organically grown crops. I wanna just touch on glyphosate for a microsecond. <laughs> and talk about a few things here, which I think are really interesting. I'll have to have you back on. We'll do a whole separate podcast on glyphosate, but I wanna show a couple of things here, you guys. And the first is this idea of the cancer rates in the United States. Oh boy, it's gonna make me turn off ad blocker. Sorry guys. Business Insider, okay. This is where we see the rate of new cancer, oh my goodness, all right. The rate of new cancer cases by state per 100,000 people, 2013, is concentrated in the Northeast and the center of the country. And what if we look at pesticide use maps in the country? <laughs> Those look pretty similar to me, you guys. <laughs> like, yeah. this is where glyphosate is used in the US and this is where we see a higher incidence of cancers. I think that these are not really questionable things to look at. Um, we'll put all this in the show notes with the sites if you guys want to see it, but um, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Clearly glyphosate, probably not a good thing to have in your diet. Probably want to do organic food when you can. Well, I mean, I mean listen, you know, you know, glyphosate inhibits the, or basically interferes with the uptake and utilization of glycine. So there's such molecular mimicry to those that glyphosate is based off the glycine molecule. So now whenever your body wants to start making proteins, it incorporates a glyphosate molecule instead of a glycine. And that leads to many detrimental effects because now essentially the protein is dysfunctional. So there's so many different issues with that. But there was a recent article that I put up onto, onto my social media as well about how people in the highest tertiary style of, of levels have the highest risk of cardiovascular mortality by 300%. So the reality is you've got to be eating organic. And even if you're eating organic, I, I suggest getting tested because there are companies, you know, we sell this, for example, on our website where we look for environmental toxins. One of those toxins is glyphosate. The other it tests for DDA, which is a breakdown product of DDT. It tests for atrazine. So again, you want to make sure that your, you know, what your level of exposure is, because even though you think you're eating organic, you need to make sure. And then also, what else is in your environment? If you're in a community that uses a lot of glyphosate and other pesticides in the community, and then I don't know, so uh, you're out there walking around and you're breathing in that air, or maybe the the landscaping crew comes in and they are blowing all this dust all over into the air and now you're getting it in as well. So, so many different ways that we are getting exposed, but it's nice to, to measure your level of exposure and then you know what you're up against and then work on detoxification strategies uh, and then also trying to improve avoidance of those toxins. Yeah, I totally agree. I think measuring glyphosate levels is valuable. And here it is, N-phospho, 
uh, N-phosphonomethylglycine is glyphosate. So no wonder it mimics glycine in the human body. You all listening to this know from my previous podcast and my book that glycine is a critical amino acid of two proteins, but many proteins in the human body, collagen and glutathione, sort of important proteins in our metabolism that you should not ignore. And you do not want to be putting something in there that is going to mimic those. Here's a glyphosate technical fact sheet from the National Pesticide Information Center. We'll put this in the show notes as well. It talks about the mechanism of action for glyphosate interrupting the shikimate pathway, which is also problematic for the microbiome. And they, um, the uh, justification that glyphosate is safe is that, hey, this shikimate, the shikimic pathway is not present in humans. Well, it's present in bacteria. So <laughs> you know, putting in a pesticide into your gut that could disrupt the microbiome in a big way could potentially be pretty problematic. Not a good thing. Another one we'll put in the show notes, a uh, wide range of diseases linked to pesticides, sort of a summary review article with many references, uh, looking at evidence that these pesticides are linked to illness. As we're saying, if you live in this part of the country or the San Fernando Valley or here or here or here, you probably wanna get your glyphosate levels checked. And even if you live here, you probably still wanna get your glyphosate levels checked, but certainly if you live right here. And I heard Zach Bush say, who I want to get on the podcast, that 80% of the rivers in Indiana are no longer safe to swim in because of the pesticide runoff. But look at this epicenter. I mean, I'm sorry, you guys. I, I just, it's so scary to live in this part of the country right here because of this amount of glyphosate usage. That is scary. Here's a paper by and, Stephanie and, and, F talking about glyphosate yeah. suppression of cytochrome P450 enzymes and amino acid biosynthesis by the gut microbiome. It's her hypothesis paper. I think it's really interesting. Pathways to modern diseases, scary stuff, scary stuff. So I think that the take home here is get organic food. It's worth the investment. And even if you're eating organic food, get your glyphosate level checked just so you know. It's a water soluble toxin. So if you're drinking water that's not filtered in a way that's going to remove glyphosate, you could be getting glyphosate in your drinking water. <laughs> Depending well, on your- yeah, also, you know, Paul, you know, it's like, you know, listen, you know, you go over to Whole Foods or natural grocers and you're getting this organic produce. But again, what is the what is the water that those companies sprayed, you know, that they used to water their crops? And then as you go into Whole Foods, for example, and they're keeping everything moist up on the shelves, what kind of water are they spraying onto the food uh, right there. It just, and of course, what's in the drinking water? Does your filter system filter out glyphosate? Uh, you should go ahead and get that checked. And there are, are, are companies that are basically you can just, you send in your water to the company, different levels of breakdowns and <laughs> getting tested for glyphosate. Very, very important. We recently tested our well water where we live, tested for glyphosate. Thankfully, it was, it was negative and we do have filters on top of that. But even the water that we were getting in from the well doesn't have glyphosate. But uh, it's it's very important to uh, to get that test. It's just so it does to the gut microbiome. Uh, you know, we're just uh, it's just a nasty experiment that we're all inundated. It's scary, and ultimately, we I think that knowledge is power. Ignorance is bliss until it's not. Ignorance is bliss until you get a a very severe disease that you can't fix. You know. So, so don't be ignorant, don't be blissful in that respect. Knowledge is power. Know where you are, know what's in your food. Um, I know that uh, Great Plains Labs does uh, glyphosate testing as, many, as well as many other toxins. It's probably a good thing to check in general. Um, and, and I love what you said there, I hadn't even thought about that. When you go to Whole Foods and they have that little thunder sound and that mister comes down on your vegetables and then you wash them under the tap water, I mean, it's a small amount, but it could add up. Like ultimately just check your glyphosate levels and see if you have an issue that's not fixed, it would be pretty important to know that. Circling back here, just to bring this conversation full circle, um, I wanna share a really interesting genetic syndrome that I, that I talked about in my book um, that I think illustrates the conversation around cholesterol very well. smith lemley oppitz syndrome, which is a polymorphism in the enzyme that makes 7-dehydro uh, cholesterol uh, actually, it reduces 7-dehydrocholesterol, 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase. And it's a rare genetic syndrome. And basically what happens is 
if you inhibit this enzyme, which is in the mevalonate pathway, you don't make cholesterol. Uh, children who are born with this disease have um, cleft palate, uh, facial feature problems, heart defects, a few second and third toes, extra fingers and toes, underdeveloped extra external genitals in males, and um, they also have uh, severe infections uh, because they do not make cholesterol and because they have very severe uh, deficits in LDL particles. And so what is the therapy? Cholesterol supplementation, one or two egg yolks, sometimes in combination with bile acids, appears to improve growth and reduce, reduce photosensitivity in individuals with smith lemley oppitz syndrome with no harmful side effects. And it also improves um, the, uh, the severe infections that they get. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> that in a genetic condition where you don't make cholesterol, where you achieve what most, many would theoretically hope to be the, the, the point of status, to completely abrogate, to completely annihilate cholesterol from your body, the kids are, they're developmentally delayed, they have developmental abnormalities, they have sexual abnormalities, they have severe infections, and you can correct it or at least ameliorate it somewhat by giving them pure cholesterol in the form of egg yolks with no apparent side effects. Anyone, I just, I mean, this should be taught in every cardiology residency, like, wait a minute, how can cholesterol be so bad for us in that situation? So, well, you know, I mean, I think, you know, and, and why does, why does an egg contain cholesterol? Yeah. Is, is, is it trying to kill the chicken? Uh, you know, the egg, it you know, contains cholesterol because that's what it needs to take to make a chicken, to, for a chicken to come to life. You can't raise a chicken on oatmeal. It has to have cholesterol that's inside of that egg. And now the chicken, the ongoing embryo, uh, which is the chick, which can eventually, you know, hatch. It's because it's digested the cholesterol that's inside of the yolk of the yolk sac. So it's, it's obviously, it's, it's so, so important. And the fact that it's been vilified for 50 plus years, again, has led to the useless death of millions of people. And uh, well, that's why I appreciate you to get the message out there so we can make a difference and make a change to all that. And many listeners may not know this, but in human embryonic development, we have a yolk sac too. And you better believe that that yolk sac in a human is full of cholesterol as well. And that a, that a developing brain in a human being is, is absolutely using cholesterol to make, is using ketones to make cholesterol. Which I is breast milk. milk. I mean, I mean, I mean, breast milk. Breast milk yeah. is loaded with cholesterol, loaded yes. with saturated fat. Why, yes. is, why does animal milk contain cholesterol? It's because that's how you build the baby's brain. That's how you build the baby's body. Um, you know, and you're not going to do it with oatmeal. That's for sure. That's just all yeah. propaganda. Breast milk is not oatmeal shooting out of breasts. That's not. That's not how we do it. It's also not kale, you guys. Right? There's no kale coming out of breasts for breast milk. Um, last paper here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, beyond LDL cholesterol, the role of elevated triglycerides and low LHDL in residual CVD risk remaining after statin therapy. Isn't that an interesting idea? And this is exactly what we were talking about earlier, that statins really probably do not lower your, L your cardiovascular risk in secondary prevention trials by lowering LDL. Uh, they do it by improving inflammation and <clears throat> residual risk remains because there is remaining high triglycerides, low HDL, which is indicative of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So anyway, we kind of wrapped it all up in there. We covered a ton in this podcast. The last thing I want to touch on is the results in your clinic, because you mentioned that um, I think paleolithic diets are great. And I think that a lot of paleolithic diets are basically carnivore-ish. But before the podcast, you mentioned that in your clinic, you've even done carnivore resets, like one week carnivore uh, interventions with your with your patients, and I'm just so curious to hear what happened with those. Yeah, we call it the uh, you know like the seven day carnivore challenge, and I think it's a great way to kind of segue you know people into it, and uh, um, as, <clears throat> as opposed to you know some of these people maybe that dive into longer, it's like you know, you know dip your toes in, see how you do over the seven days, and the people that do it they do fantastic, and it's been great because we get them into Facebook groups, they get to share recipes, share how they're feeling, share their struggles, share their success. But invariably, when people follow it, they lose weight, they feel better, markers of inflammation. I mean, it, not, not blood markers that we test over that seven-day period, but again, uh, just how they feel overall as far as how inflamed, how much pain that they're in. Pain is a 
great marker of inflammation. And just as far as, okay, what was your pain level one out of 10 before you started and what's your pain level now after seven days? And it's really been, uh, it's really been great. And, and I tell people too, is that when you go carnivore, um, when you go paleo, when you go keto, it's not, it's not dietary restriction. You want to make sure that you're loading up on all of these foods and yet your body will naturally reset, your body will naturally lose weight. But these people that we find that we stick with it for a while, um, and then we cycle them maybe out of carnivore and back into paleo, inflammation goes down, blood pressure goes down, lipid ratios get better, vitamin D levels go up, omega-3 levels go up, homocysteine levels come down. All these different factors, thyroid numbers get better. You know what I love checking, Paul, too? I, I love checking uh, at time zero and at 90 days, men's PSA. And the PSA invariably gets better as the person gets healthier. And of course, standard conventional medicine has nothing to lower PSA except for removing the prostate. So in this scenario, it's a, it's a much better option to go after the cause, get them eating healthy. And again, we always stress that it's, it's free range grass fed. It's the wild seafood that people are eating, pasture raised eggs, and uh, eating the organs as well. I, I mean, and you talk about the expense of being able to do this. I don't have to tell you, eating organ pro meats is like, it's almost like free, relatively speaking. I mean, if you want, oh, you know, grass-fed filet, $40 a pound, I get that. But as far as eating chicken liver, that's like, you can get that for $3 a pound for pasture-raised chicken liver. Nobody wants to eat it. And uh, it'll, free. It, just mean, it, it just means more for you and I. More for you and me. They'll throw it at you if you walk into the butcher store. Yeah, right, exactly. Here, here's the chicken it. liver. They'll just throw it at you. They'll pay take you to it. take the chicken liver away. It's yeah. basically free, and it's some of the most nutritious food on the market. So that's amazing. I love it. And we'll, I love what you said there about PSA. That's, that's also super interesting. Man, so many great things we'll have to talk about next time. I think so many of these conditions are linked to insulin resistance, and Western medicine is literally blind to this connection. Like, if we are wondering why prostate-specific antigen – rises in men as they age, it is because of insulin resistance. And, and you know, insulin is a trophic hormone. I'm not saying insulin is bad, but when insulin resistance develops, and I've done multiple previous podcasts talking about insulin resistance, when insulin resistance develops, that insulin is going to rise and that is going to cause the prostate to become hypertrophic or even cancerous in some cases. And what will Western medicine do in, you know, usually with good intentions, but out of ignorance, it will yank that prostate out of you, inevitably damaging important perineal nerves that affect erectile dysfunction, all these types of things, really problematic urinary continency. The same thing happens in women with fibroids. Uh, you know, I think we miss the connections between insulin resistance and all sorts of problems in, in our daily life. And really, this, the key is simple, you know, eat a paleo diet, eat a carnivore-ish diet, eat a carnivore diet. All the listeners of my podcast will know at this point that I really try not to be dogmatic about a carnivore diet. I'm super excited about animal foods, but I do think that we can include some less toxic plant foods in our diet and do very well. I talk about that in my book. I think we have a slightly different perspective on that, but we agree on so much more than we disagree on. And I would really urge listeners to check out your book, The Paleo Cardiologist. I think they'll get a ton of great information from that. Where can people find more of your work, get in touch with you if they, wanna, if they want more? Dr. Jack Wolfson after this amazing episode. Now you got it, uh, Dr. Paul, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, my book right now, it's a 2015. Uh, the principles, of course, still stand. The research still stands. But we offer that now for free at freeheartbook.com. Free book? Free book. <laughs> free book. Uh, all you do is pay shipping and handling, $4.95 in the United States. Uh, freeheartbook.com. Uh, and that's how you're going to get that. And, and, and listen, and I'm not going to disagree with you as far as, you know, is, is carnivore. Can we do that for a lifetime? Can we do that for the long term? I'm not going to disagree with you that it's possible. Uh, and for the people that can do it and want to do it, I say more power to them. And again, just t test, test your lab values. And if your lipids look great and your inflammation looks great and all your markers look great, fantastic. You know, keep, keep doing it. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, again, hunter gatherer, that gatherer methodology, I think has the long term value. And I think it's, it's probably, it's definitely a lot easier for someone to maintain for, for the long term. But again, like we said, does, does the nose to tail eating uh, for, for seafood and animal products, does that encompass everything? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree. It does. 
I think it does. So what's your website? What are your soul? Where can people find more of your stuff? So, I mean, so, you know, right now we're, we, uh, we're at the doctorswolfson.com. That's my wife and I, that's our, our website. I'm also developing a program called natural heart doctor and a natural heart doctor. Again, we've got a private Facebook group that anybody can join into. You just need approval, natural heart doctor. And then another thing that I've done most recently, I've got uh, a program I'm developing called the cardiovascular health Institute, where we're trying to train medical doctors, chiropractors, naturopaths, uh, and, and even nutritionists as, as far as uh, integrative cardiology. How can we get more people into that? I'm really trying to get a lot more of the medical doctors into the program to be able to teach them, hey, listen, these are the tips, strategies, structures, these are the protocols that we use to address uh, cardiology, cardiometabolics from an integrative standpoint. That is so needed. That is so needed. And before the podcast, you were telling me that you're in Carbondale, Colorado. Well, I apologize, you guys. Dr. Jack is in an awesome place in Colorado, so that the, the feed cut out a few times. But no, that's because he's in a really radical part of Colorado doing good stuff. So the last question I always ask people is, what is the most radical thing you've done recently? And I imagine in Carbondale, Colorado, there's a lot of radical, cool things you've been up to. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, as a cardiologist, and I used to be involved, obviously, in lots of heart attacks and, and the sickest of the sick, I'm not like a major thrill seeker personally, as far as like, if you ask me, Paul, I'm like, hey, Jack, we're going on a skydiving trip, why don't you come with? Uh, that's, that's not me. Uh, but I do, I, I love mountain biking, I love cross country mountain biking, and I love downhill mountain biking. So if you ever come out to one of these kind of ski resorts where in the summertime it doubles as a downhill mountain biking course, and you're flying down that mountain at, uh, at crazy high speeds, and you're going all these twists and turns and jumps and trying to follow your 13 year old down the hill, uh, that's uh, probably the most radical thing that, that I've done. We do a lot of stand up paddle boarding here at the rivers, uh, they're not polluted like you're talking about in, in, in the Midwest, but uh, nonetheless, I make an effort to tell my kids for multiple reasons, because especially like the little ones, they just get into whether it's a, um, you know, e even if it was a pool or a river, and they just start like drinking the water. And I'm like, you know what, curb your enthusiasm for that. Uh, uh, be careful. But that's the kind of stuff we do. Just, you know, and, and you know, get, we didn't touch enough about sunshine, about sleep and stuff like that. But uh, just get outside. Just when when everybody's been told because of COVID to stay inside, worst advice of all time: get outside, get outside, and live your life every day. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, my friend. We'll have to have you back on, and I I hope that you'll be down here to Austin sometime soon, and we can go swimming in a non glyphosate polluted river. Or I'll be there in Colorado, and we can go mountain biking. But Again, Sounds thank awesome you so much ball. for coming on, and I'll, I'll, I can't wait to talk to you soon. You got it, buddy. Take care. All right, everybody. It's been a fun week for me. It's been a lot of unpacking in Texas. Please check out my sponsors, whiteoakpastures.com, thecarnivorecodebook.com. Pre-order my stuff, you guys. Thank you for your support. Audiobook, print book, ebook, August the 4th, 2020. It's still on Amazon. You'll see the new cover there. And I'm so excited about broad distribution of this book. I love the old cover, and I think the new cover is going to help it reach a broader audience. And ultimately, what I hope for is that more people's lives will be improved and that we will be able to have conversations about these ideas, which were so much fun to write. I'm so grateful to do this work. I just am. I'm so stoked to be in this position. I feel incredibly blessed and grateful and hope to shake your hands and hug all of you and give you a high five. Uh, really, really soon. Um, Carnivore MD gets you 10% off your first order at White Oak Pastures. Check out Nutrisense.io for a CGM. Use the code Carnivore MD. This will be a good investment in your health. If you know someone who is struggling to lose weight or you think might be insulin resistant but doesn't understand what that is, give them the gift of a CGM because they will see this clearly. And it's all outlined in last week's podcast episode on the Continuous Glucose Monitor with my friend Kara Collier, uh, an amazingly smart dietitian from Nutrisense. So what is going on with me? I'm shooting the bow in my backyard. Watch my Instagram stories. If you want to see where I live in Texas, it is an awesome little spot that I found. I've got a huge backyard. When I get done recording this, I'm actually going to go outside right now and shoot the bow at 20 and 40 yards. Then I'm going to get a little workout in outside. It's certainly going to be sweaty, but we know that's good for us. And I'm loving it here so far. I went to the surf park in Waco the other day. And this weekend, the weekend before this podcast comes out, I am going to the Texas coast 
to go surfing. So I will let you guys know how the surfing trip in Texas goes. I've got a lot on my plate right now. I'm super busy, but realizing that I have to take care of myself in order to keep the balance and being in the water is critically important for me. I've been on the foil board in Texas already too. And like I said, I'm just stoked to be here. Really good people, lots of friends and community here. And I hope to see you guys all here very soon at a conference or on the lake or wherever. If you see Carnivore MD, just walk up and say, what's up, Paul? Every once in a while, I'm in a grocery store and somebody says, you're Carnivore MD. And I say, oh yeah, I'm Paul. But I guess you guys might think of me as Carnivore MD. So thank you for your support of this podcast. Thank you for your support of my book. Thank you for supporting my sponsors. Please leave me a review on iTunes. If you like this podcast, leave me in my book a review on Amazon if you like it. And I will see you guys in the future. Stay radical, people.